with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning and welcome to the show. I'm Julia hartley Brewer, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, the government's flagship Rwanda bill has suffered yet more defeats in the House of Lords that could see deportation flights delayed until June, assuming they ever do take off. And the Work and Pension Secretary, Mel Stride, has warned that mental health culture has gone too far. Hear, hear from him saying that. With spending on welfare rising to a whopping £100 billion this year and a sharp rise in young people on long-term sick pay, Mel Stride said we've forgotten that work is good for mental health. And three members of staff at a private hospital are under investigation now for allegedly trying to access the Princess of Wales' private medical records. Uh, we'll be talking about that and, of course, the uh, interest rate decision for Bank of England when it comes out at 12 and plenty more besides. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Emily Rose Adams. Good morning. There's been another embarrassing defeat for the government over its flagship Rwanda bill after the House of Lords passed seven proposed changes. They include a provision to ensure due regard for domestic and international law, which means MPs will now have to vote on the bill again, which will delay the whole process until after Easter. Well, pollster Scarlett Maguire's told Talk TV immigration is a key issue the public want resolved. Do you know that immigration is a priority of voters, especially of Conservative 2019 voters? They'd like to see action. Not just that, but we, you know, when you test the concept of a plan like Rwanda, just saying anyone who arrives here illegally should be deported, and then there are, you know, either processes put in place for legal processing or not, that gets uh, more support than any of the other options. That has a plurality of support, and that's actually the same across most demographics. A new report out today has warned that the NHS needs a financial boost of £8.5 billion a year to tackle the service's current crisis. The BMJ Commission says pledges made by the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt in the recent spring budget will not sufficiently make up the budget shortfall of around £32 billion. Well, former NHS doctor and broadcaster Dr Ima Khan has told us we need to do much more than pump cash into the service. I think, you know, what we need to be looking at is not just throwing money at the NHS, but how we can restructure it, how we can become more efficient, mm. and also how we can engage other agencies like the food agencies and um, other organisations that have an impact on our health as yeah. we move forward. Mm. And I think the responsibility goes way beyond just the NHS for good health. The family of a British woman who vanished in the US Virgin Islands three years ago have asked the President of the United States for help to find her. Sam Heslop, a former air hostess from Southampton, moved there to live with, on a boat with her new boyfriend, Ryan Bain. But in March 2021, during the night, the 41-year-old disappeared from the catamaran. The Bank of England is expected to hold interest rates at 5.25% for a fifth time in a row later on. Despite the lower-than-expected inflation figures yesterday, it's widely expected to be cautious about indicating when future cuts might take place. Meanwhile, official figures show UK government borrowing was higher than expected in February at £8.4 billion. A new survey claims the majority of parents believe the government should ban smartphones for under-16s. 83% said they felt they were harmful to children and young people, according to a survey by the charity Parent Kind, which is warning society has sleepwalked into a position where children are addicted to devices. And we told you about the brain chip that Elon Musk's company had successfully implanted into someone's brain. Well, now Neuralink, Neuralink sorry, has released the first video of the patient who received it, playing a game of online chess with his brain. 29-year-old Noland Arbour was left paralysed below the shoulders after a driving accident, but now he can control a computer mouse with his thoughts. It just became intuitive for me to start imagining the cursor moving. Um, basically, 
it was like uh, using the force on the cursor, <laughs> and I could get it to move wherever I wanted, just stare somewhere in the screen, and it would move where I wanted it to. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Isabel Lang. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Definitely a changeable look to things and an increasingly cold one too as we head through tomorrow. Today, a wet and windy picture for northwestern areas, whereas further south, once the misty low cloud lifts, there will be at least some sunshine. Quite mild in the sun as well, with temperatures up to about 17, possibly 18 degrees, but colder as that rain clears through across the north. And in fact, it will turn increasingly chilly as we head through tonight across northern areas as that rain clears away, turning quite showery as well. Blustery showers for northern Scotland and northern Ireland. You can see how that rain gradually slides its way south through the night so it'll be a pretty mild night for central and southern parts of Britain but increasingly wet for Wales, North Midlands, the southwest of England and that rain will continue to track southeastwards during the day tomorrow so you can see that contrast in temperature so it might well start off okay temperature wise in the southeast tomorrow but we'll find that temperatures lower through the day behind that frontal system pretty soggy picture actually for a few hours across the south but elsewhere it does turn brighter but there will be showers developing especially heavy across the northwest bit of hail thrown in as well and an increasingly chilly picture for all of us as we head through Friday night and Saturday. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome back to the show. Good morning to you. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer and you are with Talk TV. Lots to talk about, as always, on the show. Joining me to run through all of the biggest stories of the day and some of the little ones that have caught our fancy <laughs> is former senior military intelligence officer Philip Ingram. Still needs a shorter title. Good, Good morning. morning to you. Good morning to yeah. you. Or you or just him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That bloke, Philip, he's on again. I mean, that, that would do, wouldn't it? It's like that, you know, that, that girl, Julia. There you are, done. Look, um, the economy, Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Well, both, both very much in the news. We're awaiting the interest rate decision for the Bank of England at, at midday. Very likely they will hold interest rates, as yep. the experts say, of course, experts are often wrong, but at 5.25%. Even though inflation dropped by more than expected, again, experts don't get it always right, from 4% uh, in, 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 to 3.4% uh, for the last month. So, you know, we're seeing things going in the right direction. What we really need is the is the interest rates to come down to help people with their mortgages and things. Prime Minister spoke to um, uh, his MPs at the uh, 22 committee last night and he said that a, a new economic moment is, is, <laughs> is coming to the country. Um, a do, moment, do, are you not an era. I mean, it's sunny. <laughs> it's quite miserable weather there. Looking, but it, it's a lovely. It's been it's been lovely all week. We got lovely weather this morning. Certainly where we are. Um, I'm fair, I think people are feeling a little bit of the. Oh, we're out of the doldrums. It's not miserable and grey every day. Things are getting better. Inflation is getting down to a reasonable level. Are you feeling a new economic moment? Well, maybe there's a moment, but I think we should have a new economic era. And we are coming out of winter, so seasonally affected disorder, and I think we're talking yep. disorders later, will we'll be disappearing and people will be starting to feel happier as the sun comes well, in. So maybe happy. now is the time to well, when they talk, yes. suggest the economy is getting better. But exactly. I mean, this is one of the things. I mean, when they talk about, you know, in Mediterranean, people you know, living longer and having a more positive outlook, you know, yeah, if you live in the sunshine and you're outdoors all the time, you're, you're happier. Going of course you are. We're all, that's why we go on holidays. Well, you Finland was uh, the, the happiest country in the world, I think, and they're, they get, the, they yes, get but, darkness for almost six but, months Yeah, but year. for half the year, they have yeah. nothing but light. Well, exactly. Which apparently yeah. is actually very bad for you. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, we also have a massive welfare state and everything functions. Uh, yes, that's the important I'm thing. I'm thinking living it. somewhere where everything functions might be good. Um, where something well, functions might be good. <laughs> well, well, indeed. I mean, one thing that doesn't function, and that is flights to Rwanda to deport people. Uh, we've seen yet more defeats in the House of Lords uh, last night. Um, it appears voted uh, on seven different amendments. So they were originally there were 10 amendments that they brought in uh, to the the, uh, the the bill which had been passed by the Commons. That was then sent back to the Commons. The Commons had their votes on Monday night. They sent that back because they've got a Tory majority in the Commons for this. Uh, and then the peers said, right, well, we're going to vote on seven more of these measures. Lots of whipping by Labour and Lib Dems and by the Tories. Apparently a load of peers no one's seen in God knows how many years <laughs> before forced to turn up out of their, uh, from their stately homes and, and the like. Um, um, and and that, that means with those seven defeats, there's not now time to get this through before Parliament uh, uh, goes into recess for, for ahead of the Easter break. I mean, on a technicality, they could get it through if they really wanted. Mm. Surely they could do an emergency debate today, but they're going to leave it now. That means 
There's no chance really of getting those flights off the ground before mid-June. Laughably, the Treasury and the Home Office are still referring to this as spring. <laughs> I don't know, but I think, I think we're going to hope they feel in... It's late, late spring, early summer. Late spring, yeah. early summer. Early um, summer. A question I'm asking our audience today, I'm going to put it to our audience and I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Uh, this is, this is the, audience, the, message we, the question we put out. The government's flagship Rwanda bill suffering yet more defeats in the House of Lords. The question is, do you have any faith in the Rwanda deportation policy? Because every morning we think, should we ask another question on Rwanda? And our hearts sink, but... This has become such a big policy, such a big flagship bill, and yet no one I know who supports it thinks it's a game changer in any way when it comes to, you know, getting a, uh, any sort of deterrent together for people coming across the channel. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Do you have any faith in the Rwanda deportation policy? Is this now just sort of a, a you know, a white elephant project? Is it, is, it, is it more about the principle than it is about the practice? Tell me what you think. Give us a call. 0344 499 1000. Text on 8722. We'll get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. Um, let's uh, get to what you think then, Phil. Well, I think the government has bigged it up to being such a big issue that the opposition or anyone who just wants to kick the government thinks, oh, I've got an opportunity now. And it's a really easy opportunity. It's an open goal. Um, and that's all that's happening. We're, we're seeing politics being played out for, for politics' sake and not for the substance behind its sake. Now, I don't know what the opposition are going to do. I, I heard them talk about um, uh, opening up more legal routes on the continent and immediately deporting people who don't meet the criteria. Well, that's all part of what the government is saying. There doesn't seem to be anything different coming out. So we're going to see what a, a slight delay. It's gone back to the, the, um, uh, the House of Lords on the 25th of April and then back into the House of Commons the 26th when it passes then um, with any luck the government will have a few people but it'll just be token uh, on, on and, a plane ready to go. And this is the thing it is just going to be a token number yeah. of people you say the Rwanda government so, <laughs> or can we can we stagger this I mean <laughs> how long is this going to take and yet there is this principle which is that a democratically elected government has got this policy now it's not in their manifesto admittedly um, do I think this is really going to be a big change no it's going to cost an absolute fortune mm -hmm. I mean the cost of putting people in hotels is a fortune the cost of putting them on barges and in RAF barracks, as we discovered yesterday in a new NAO report, also fortune 40 plus million more mm -hmm. than it's already costing. It's costing us billions to have these people here. Um, even the moving up the goose, speeding up the processing is going to cost a fortune, but that should be the number one priority, not where they live while you're processing. Speed up the processing. Any deportation programme is going to involve a huge amount of legal challenges. Not only do we pay the legal costs of the government, we pay the legal costs of the person oh, oh, challenging exactly. as well. Um, uh, and then and flying them out to Rwanda. I mean, I think people are talking about, you know, I mean, you, you, could, you could basically move into the Ritz the rest of your life at the same cost, you know. Um, it, this has become a nonsense. But it all starts with the problem that we've got a load of people coming to this country illegally. And the ones we talk mm -hmm. about on the boats are just, I mean... You know, they're not the only ones. There are loads who come here on boats that we don't know about, mm -hmm. um, and people who just disappear into the system, get off the beaches and, and, and just disappear somewhere else. We've got people still coming in, smuggled in in lorries. A huge number of people who've come here on a legal visa to, as a holiday, who overstay. Mm -hmm. It's estimated, I mean, even a few years ago, 1.5 million people here are living and working here with no right to be here at all. This is off the scale at a time when we have a housing crisis, uh, an NHS crisis, uh, we have a, a welfare crisis in terms of the number of people we've got on welfare. And putting a few people on a flight to Rwanda ain't gonna solve any no, of that. No, it's 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 a, a, t a tiny token and you're what Rishi Sunak should have done whenever he came in was gone. My predecessors were looking at Rwanda, I'm gonna bring in something different, open yeah. up legal, um, places to go and seek asylum um, uh, on the continent so that the, the people have to collect there. If they don't get the yeah. rubber stamp on them, get a way of throwing them out of the country immediately and bring in national identity cards so that oh, even without see, that... This is the well, solution to everything. always ends up being we all have to have national ID cards. And we're going to talk later in the show about exactly. a report that millions of people will be disenfranchised because they won't have photo ID when they go... Uh, to the, the polling booth oh, later garbage. this year. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's my view. A lot of people don't have photo ID, but how do you live life without photo? How do you but, do anything but, without but, photo but even, ID? So, you know, I, I come from Northern Ireland. You've had to have photo ID for many, many years to go and vote. That's, that's yeah. one point... In most one, one point European three, countries. Six million people testing the system, and it's worked. Yeah. So how can we say it's not going to work in England? I mean, there are so many things. I mean, I I'm, I'm of the air. <laughs> you need more ID to get a blockbuster video card. I'm that old. Um, then you need it. You need, you need, I mean, 
even getting married. I remember you, you had to show <laughs> photo ID. So what, you can't get yeah. married if you're... Yeah. There are so many reasons why you need photo ID. Exactly. And, it, and it would just make it easier and solve so many other problems. And, and make it free as well. Um, talking of the welfare crisis, let's also talk about what Mel Stride has had to say. He's the Work and Pension Secretary. And he said that, you know, the mental health culture has gone too far. Now, I, it's something I've been saying for a very, 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 very long time. Um, that we just have this constant, constant going on about uh, mental health in this country. We've gone from, we don't talk about mental health enough to, that's all people yeah. talk about. Yeah. I keep trying to explain to people, um, anyone, I think a lot of people under the age of 30, that between your, your bio on LinkedIn or, or, or Twitter or Instagram, your mental health issues are neither interesting mm -hmm. <laughs> to anybody nor relevant to anything. People aren't interested. Now, if someone you're working with someone, you're friends with someone, they're a family member, and it's relevant, absolutely, and people should be supportive and kind and understanding. But people kind of introduce, go, hello, my name's John. I have a mental health problem. And I just think, well, why, why do you even think I want mm -hmm. to know about that? But this is often used, as we know, for a reason not to work, which is one of the reasons why we have so many millions of people working age who are not working. But um, Bell Stride um, avail plans to make 150,000 people signed off work with mild conditions look for a job. Again, these, these measures are never strong enough, in my view. Um, but there's a massive concern. We've got a £100 billion bill this year for welfare. Huge amount of that is mm. pensions, uh, understandably. People who have disabilities or looking after disabled children are incapacitated for periods of time because of you know, cancer treatment or something. Absolutely, we need to be making sure those people have a decent standard of living and never struggle, never yeah. worry about putting the yeah. heating on. But we can't do that when we're spending so much money on people who should be in work. Well, 100%, you know, I, I know of people who are gaming the system across the board. And the trouble but is... But we all do, don't we? Yeah, we do. And, and this, is, this is where you know, it's, it's wrong in society. And, and it seems to be that mental health conditions now, if you've got a label, you wear it as a badge of honour. Yeah. Instead of it actually being something that you, you need to get treated. And I saw this in the military whenever um, PTSD started to get talked about. Mm. So many people felt that when you became a veteran, you had to say you had PTSD, yeah. whether it was diagnosed or not. If you've had PTSD, it is either... Um, uh, and, and you, or you've got PTSD, you either don't know you've got it and you're falling apart, mm. you've fallen apart or you're dead. Um, it is that serious. Yeah. And... Putting all these labels on really detract from the people who are properly suffering. Yeah. Because they're the but, ones in the quiet. But, and that's the thing for me. If people say well, you're being unsympathetic, no, when, you know, when every child has ADHD or autism or when every, every, every adult has some sort of mental health incapacity, then, then you don't get to treat, you don't have the time and the space and the staff and the resources to treat, to treat those, those who do, genuinely who do need deserve it. A, a, a good and, friend and of mine, yeah, yeah. Who's, a, who's a head teacher in, in a city school, and says, look, you know, I've probably got, you guys probably, in the, which is a massive school, you know, 1,500 kids or plus, you know, probably got like six to 10 kids who, if they don't get their medication, hmm. we're all in trouble. You know, but the rest of the kids who've all got this sort of special education need sign offs, whatever the terminology is this week. Um, so yeah, lots of, you know, they've just got, you know, sorry, they've not been parented properly a lot of the time. Yeah. They, you know, they're, you know, they've got no routine. They don't eat healthy food. They're on, you know, they're on uh, gadgets all the time until late at night. They don't get enough sleep. I think one of the most fundamental issues we have in our country this, these days, and Western society generally, is, is people don't get enough sleep. Yeah. I, not getting enough sleep drives you crazy. It really does. It makes you bad tempted. Make you can't learn. You can't function. Uh, you, you know, you do develop. You know. It, symptoms of mental illness we we've got a load of kids who even at the age of you know two years old four years old 10 years old 20 years old you know, they are not getting enough sleep well, they're not eating healthily they've got no routine their lives spiral out of control and that is all shown up as effectively a label for some sort of mental health problem well, when actually yeah. what people need is is routine and rules and, and, and regularity and, and all these things. And I know I sound really old-fashioned, but I think it works. No, but you've, you've, you've mentioned the two things that I was, I was going to say. You're, the routine is critical. Absolutely. Um, because you have to get that in there. And discipline. You know, there, there has to be some form of respect for um, people in society um, in the, the jobs that you would look up to. So you know, school kids need respect for teachers. They need respect yep. for head teachers. They need respect for police. They don't. No. You know, the amount of abuse that goes around at the minute. And no, but even another adult, like when kids are like messing about on the bus or something, and an adult, you know, my day, you'd, you'd be terrified of another adult. Yeah. But uh, now you say, excuse me, would you mind? They look at you. I mean, they, it's not yeah. even that they just get... OK, they usually get abusive, but they look at you like... 
what? I don't even understand why an adult's telling me off. Like, well, exactly. does this never happen in your home? Yeah. yeah. It happens I'm, in my I'm, home, I'll if, tell if you. I get, if I got told off um, and then went home and told my mum that I'd been told off by someone else, she'd then um, yeah, tell me off again. But exactly, exactly. But this thing, as, as Mel Strider is saying, you know, the mental health culture, it has gone too far and we need to get back to, you know, supporting people. I mean, certainly, you know, my mum, who was a GP, always said, you know, People getting signed off because they've got mental health problems, you know, or, or stress things. Actually, it's one of the worst things, unless it's something really, really dire at that time, because actually work is good for you. It's good for your physical yeah. health, your mental health yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, let's talk about, well, uh, people who were told that actually they could retire from work rather earlier than they thought uh, they was, well, or later, sorry, than they thought they could, the WASPy women. Uh, later this morning, there's going to be a long way to report out about how women born in the 1950s were affected by the increases in their retirement age. Um, an ombudsman has been looking at this for five years, the potential injustice. There's a possibility there could be a suggestion of compensation. Given the number of women involved, and it is millions of women who were affected, this could be a huge sum of money. Now, there's a group called WASPy, which is Women Against State Pension Inequality. They say they should receive compensation. Now, Changes first passed by the Commons almost 30 years ago. Um, and uh, uh, basically they changed the, because, because of equality rulings, quite rightly, men retired at 65, women retired at 60. Uh, and it basically change was made that, you know, in years to come, women would also retire at 65. And then around that time also, the decision was made to raise the pension age to 66 for both men and women. Mm -hmm. So there's a group of women who basically saw their retirement age go up by six years. A lot of these women say, look, we weren't given notice about this. Look, it was in the budget, it was in the paper, it was on the yeah. TV. But they say, look, I wasn't sent a letter until just a couple of years beforehand. Many of them worked as carers for their family members mm -hmm. and others don't have any private pension or any occupational pension. They've only got the state pension. They were relying on that, which is a bigger sum than they were getting as a carer. And they basically say, well, I could just about manage, but I couldn't manage for another six years and they want compensation. What do you think about this? Well, you know, you look at in isolation and it sounds uh, horrific that they've been um, put in this position, but you, lo you look at it from a wider picture and at, at the same time, you were getting all the fights for women's rights, for equality, for um, uh, equal pay uh, and everything else. And that was coming along at the same time. You, when you bring or you change rules in, there's always going to be a group that... Yeah, at any point when you raise the pension age, it's exactly. going to be a group that they're exactly. going to lose and, out. And you either want the whole picture or you want none of the picture. Um, and therefore, I think, unfortunately, these are a few people that have fallen between the, between the, the cracks of the rules. Yeah. Um, and it's tough. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, um, uh, I, 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 I'm of the view, you know, it was men who lost out for all those decades when they didn't get to retire. Um, at 60. At the same age. In fact, actually, that report has literally, in the last couple of minutes, just come out, and the investigation has found that thousands of women may have been affected by the Department for Work and Pensions' failure to adequately inform them that the state pension age uh, has uh, had changed. Uh, so we're just looking into whether or not they will actually um, hand out any actual compensation to those women, because of course that will uh, be a huge big cost for everybody else. But and then I think there might be an argument for a uh, there's a you know a couple of hundred thousand women who were specifically badly affected, mm -hmm. uh, who were impoverished by this. But I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm not that sympathetic to this. A couple of other stories I want to get to. Um, the New England football kit, head of the European <laughs> uh, uh, the, the European Championship, has come out. Oh, I, Nike put it out. Honestly, I, I just want to. I just want to. Oh, I just want to slap these people. Can I say that? I probably can't say that, but I won't. I won't do it. I'm just saying. New kit. And they tweeted out a playful update to the cross of St George appears on the collar, the back of the kit, to unite and inspire. Um, instead of this simple, you know, white background, red flag, red red cross, because that is the cross of St George. They've decided to do it. I'm just. I'm just looking at my phone so I can just describe it. It's. It's sort of got red up and down the vertical bit, but the long bit. Is sort of pink and pale blue and, and and dark blue or purple. It's difficult to tell. And they say that this is going to unite and inspire. Uh, I don't think it does <laughs> unite us football fans, and it definitely doesn't inspire anything other than derision and contempt. C complete derision. You, you've got a symbol for um, for a reason, and as soon as you start messing around with the symbol, it's not a symbol anymore. Do you think? Do you think they do that with? Oh, I don't know. The Saudi flag. Do you, well, they, do you think they'd do that no, with the Saudi but, flag? But, but, you know, do you I, think they would? Yeah, do, do you think Nike would do it with its own logo? Yeah, uh, exactly. You know, they, they wouldn't sit and oh, do they, that, so... They probably would. But again, it's, it's, you can see from the colours, it's the woke karate. Just leave the... It's the it's, it doesn't have to be an expression yeah. of, of diversity or whatever they but it, think but it it's, is. But it's it's not. Just, <laughs> it, by definition, it's not. The flag is what we unite around. That is what we... The, the image is what... I don't have flags that colour. It, I've got white flags with big red crosses on. It's not the on. England flag anymore. It's not the England symbol anymore. It's so a, they're, basically so they're putting, a pretend they're putting something, they're, they're, putting, they're putting something 
you weird onto oh, the England football shirt. Absolutely. Not that I'm a football fan. Um, um, my accent. Well, I'm not yes. a Nike fan, that's for sure. <laughs> um, Gladys, what's going? Are you worried about your Easter eggs going up in price? No. <laughs> <laughs> Are you worried about them going down in size? No. Because if I want if I want proper chocolate, they're not they're not good value for money anyway. So right, yeah. okay. I'll, I know I'll, I'll, they're going to be shouting I'll, in my ear to I'll move steal on. Kids no, this is oh, we all, I mean, obviously <laughs> don't buy them too far in advance because you'll just eat them and then you have to hide the packaging. And we've all done it. Yeah. We've all done it. Um, but, and then buy another one. Okay, here's the thing: they're very bad value for money for the amount of chocolate yeah. you get. However, I put it to you: chocolate tastes better in an egg shape. It tastes I better. Uh, yeah. It tastes better in an egg shape. Mm. Okay. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna win. <laughs> do you think we should send someone out for some Easter eggs and we'll just try Easter eggs and a bar of chocolate and we'll do the taste we'll test? Do the test. You know you live. want to. <laughs> we got expenses for this show. I don't think we do. Uh, also, I just just gratuitously want to show a picture of Emmanuel Macron boxing. Apparently, um, I'll describe this. Because he has tiny little. No, he's got very muscly, but nevertheless very short Tyrannosaurus-y little legs, uh, little little uh, little little hands. But it's very very. Putin esque pictures. Very Putin esque. Put out black and white of Manuel Macron punching a, a, a sort of punching back in his, in his boxing training. We see him very much as quite a sort of a, you know, a new man, sort of like Mr. Mr. Sort of nerdy man about Parisian a, town. A small man as well. Yes. yes. Do you think ahead of the European elections in June in, in, in France, which doesn't look like his party is going to look, do very well compared to Marine Le Pen's, um, do you think that um, this is him just trying to do a little bit of the Putin? You know, riding around, he's going to be on horse, it, but horseback, naked at this rate. It is. He's he's talking very aggressively at the moment. You know, he's talking yeah. very aggressively about French troops potentially going into into Ukraine and various other things. So this is part of his his move to try and make him uh, look stronger, more, more Put strong man, Putin esque. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah. I just can't the calendar, wait. The calendar comes out next week. Absolutely. I, can't, I just can't wait for Donald <laughs> Trump to do the same. Uh, I wonder if we can see the equivalent of Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer. I'm not sure <laughs> oh, it would be no, very please. good. Anyway, right. So let's uh, move on. Let's uh, talk about the flagship Rwanda bill uh, that has. Um, oh, they've God, just had a pic, they've just had a bit well. of video up there. Oh, they've a video of, a, of, 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 of Keir Starmer, Starmer boxing. No, no not no. not a good look, mate. Uh, especially when you're doing it in your white shirt. It's like Boris Johnson always playing, you know, he goes out for a jog in his white work shirt. Exactly. I don't, we've got, we need to go back on. All right, we are asking about the government's flagship Rwanda bill, which suffered yet more defeats in the House of Lords last night. Uh, I've been asking you now, have you got any faith in the Rwanda deportation policy? You can give us a call, 0344 499 text 87222, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Cliff has done that and says, Rwanda was dead in the water from the start. There's more chance of David Beckham becoming prime. Prime Minister. Oh, God, don't give him ideas. Uh, Tom says, it's ridiculous that a government with a majority can't pass legislation due to a load of unelected individuals in the Lords. Hear, hear to that. And Roger says, it hasn't been created to succeed. It's been created to waste time and then fail. Oh, interesting. Uh, you've also been getting in touch on the phone lines. Keep those calls coming in. Let's go to Dave, who's in Oxford. Hello, Dave. Hi, Julia. Hello, Please what do you want Hello. to say? Do you have any faith in this policy? Well, it's, it's, it's the whole kind of concept that I'm grasping for, for breath for. Um, your guest came on and said uh, earlier this morning, like uh, many other people say, oh, we should set up safe and legal routes in Europe yeah. so people can apply um, in, in other places and then we can bring them in in a more managed way. Won't work because all those, all those places who have safe and legal routes and all the people that apply, uh, that come in, will be fine. But then all the people who don't come in, yeah. well, guess what? They'll go to the beach, they'll get exactly. on a boat and they'll come anyway. Exactly. Most of those young men arriving from wherever, we don't know because they don't have their documentation largely when they arrive, um, they will, uh, they, they won't, they're not going to be the most needy people who are going to get uh, 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 approved legally. So, they're, yeah, they're going to still queue up, aren't they? Of course they are. So it won't achieve anything. Safe and legal routes won't achieve anything yep. at all because if you get refused, you'll just come on a boat, throw your documents in the in the channel and say, uh, I'm claiming asylum and we yep. won't be able to remove them because we don't know where to remove them for. So please tell me what good are safe and legal routes. Yeah, a very good point. Can I ask you, do you think these Rwanda flights will ever take off? Do they solve any yeah, part yeah, of the problem? I think they, yeah, I think, I think they'll get a couple of flights off. But, and it's just, it should be just part of a bigger, bigger um, uh, plan. It yeah. shouldn't be the answer, because it won't be, but it's yeah. got to be part of a bigger plan. But they could stop this tomorrow if they wanted. They could stop it tomorrow. How? Just turn the boats back. Literally, physically. Yeah, Philip Ingram's not, not, not thinking that's uh, viable. This thing, no, physically. If, if, I mean, if, one, of the, if one of the key things serious, is... If the government were serious, they would just turn the boats back. It would stop immediately. And just basically say, French Coast Guard, it's up to you. 
The yeah, first boat that goes down point. and someone dies, you know that policy ends that Don't day. Don't care. Don't care. Don't care. I think you may be speaking for a lot of the nation who said I, I have to say, I'm, I have very little, I know this is a terrible thing, I have very little sympathy for the people who, who die in these boats. You look at that boat, you're going, seriously? Like, you're going, if you're choosing to leave perfectly safe country, France, to take that risk, then frankly, you're a fool. That said, I've been told by those who work in, in that field that actually these people think they're kind of going across like a, a, a small river or something. They genuinely don't know it's as wide and as dangerous a sea route uh, as it is. I'm not interested. I'm not interested. Yeah, we've got not my local, problem. We've got, we've got local people here around, around our area and they're, they're, they're disabled and they're older and they've got a bus, a bus uh, that brings them into town once a week yeah. uh, hospital appointments and doctor's appointments. That's being closed down because it needs half a million pounds. And we're spending £8.2 million pounds on people that haven't contributed anything. I'm fed up with it. I'm done. Done. Now, Dave, I think you're speaking for a nation. Dave, thank you very much indeed. That's Dave in Oxford. I don't think it's David Cameron. Um, very, very quick word from you, Philip. Yeah, well, I, I, I tend to agree with Dave. The trouble is the solutions are all illegal um, and therefore it's that's impossible for a government to bring them in. But again, that's one of the things, like, maybe you need to change the laws if they're illegal. They are. Coming up after the break, more on the government's Rwanda bill, something this to Pete's in the House of Lords, what happens next. I'm Julia hartley Brew, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to... <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Brewer, and you are with Talk TV. Now, the government's flagship Rwanda bill has suffered a series of defeats in the House of Lords that could see deportation flights delayed until June. I feel like I'm going to be saying that sentence or an equivalent sentence for the rest of my life. Uh, joining me right now is Conservative MP for Crawley. That's Henry Smith. Uh, good morning to you, Henry. 
Good morning, Julia. Thank you so much for joining us. Just uh, your reaction to those seven defeats now. It was ten amendments from the, uh, the laws previously. MPs voted to overturn those. The ping-pong went. Again, I'm never quite sure whether we're on a ping or a pong at any particular time. Gone back to the House of Laws. They've uh, done another seven uh, amendments, so another seven defeats for the government. Now it comes back again. Now we're told it's going to have to wait until after Easter. Do you have any confidence at all that these flights are ever going to take off? They have to take off. Uh, there has to be a deterrent um, and a clear message sent to the criminal gang, people smugglers, uh, that if you come to this country illegally, uh, you could be deported to Rwanda. Um, and the efforts of parties like Labour and the Liberal Democrats uh, and others in the House of Lords and indeed in the House of Commons uh, to try and stop uh, these flights going to Rwanda um, is obviously continuing. Um, I think I first raised the issue of small boats four years ago. I was, had an memory on my phone come up. Uh, and, um, you know, here we are four years down the line yesterday. I think we have one fifty the highest number. Oh, Henry, Henry, I'm so sorry. You've got a very bad line there. I don't know if we can uh, just... Can you just say that last bit again? Because it, it was cutting out a bit. We, we, we have to get the Rwanda flights um, off uh, as a fight or the beach and actually then we in Parliament. Right, I'm so uh, sorry. Henry, I'm so sorry. I don't know whether you've got a mic on your lapel or you've got it... If you could perhaps move closer to the computer, we'll hopefully be able to hear you a bit better or, um, it, it, or yeah, something, something's not working. I, the joys of Zoom and text. Um, look, I mean, while we're asking our audience today, do you have any faith in the Rwanda deportation policy? Because some people say, OK, the flights will take off, whether it's May or June or July, does it really make a difference? It's still going to be a handful of people, best case scenario, a couple of hundred people. More than that come over on the average Sunday in good weather, in which case this isn't the solution to any of the problems we've got with the, these channel boats anyway, is it? Well, I think the Rwanda plan is part of the solution, but it's only part of a much wider uh, package. Personally, uh, what I would do is I would have us leave the European Convention on Human Rights and have our own British Bill of Rights. We've been doing human rights in this country for hundreds of years. Uh, and the idea that uh, people can claim rights by entering this country illegally is wrong. And we need to leave those conventions that allow that to happen. But Rwanda is an important part of a broader mix. Um, um, and that's why it's important, I think, that those flights take off. I think it's important, I think, um, in principle, isn't it, that an elected government and an elected chamber of the House of Commons should... We know there has precedence. We know the Lords will give up, whether it's this time or next time, uh, on those amendments. But the fact that there is even this sort of ping-pong going on when there is, for a lot of people, an urgency on this, this is playing politics, isn't it, uh, from, from the peers and, you know, some, some on the left wing of the Conservative Party, Labour and Lib Dems and crossbenchers, virtually signaling how good they are because they're welcoming, you know, all migrants and aren't they lovely, lovely people. Um, but, but actually, you know, this is a policy that really matters to a lot of Tory voters. It's a policy that matters to a lot of voters full stop, regardless of what political party uh, they um, normally support. Uh, this is something that is costing the British taxpayer billions of pounds. This is something that is putting pressure on public services, on housing. Uh, and it's just manifestly unfair that you can enter a country uh, if you've been facilitated to do so by a criminal gang. That is wrong. Uh, a sovereign nation, if it can't control its borders, is no longer a sovereign nation. And there are far too many people on the left in the establishment in this country who feel that mass migration is something, as you say, that they, I don't know whether it's virtue signaling or they believe that it's important that we swell our pop population to 80 million. I, I, I don't know what the motivation is. Is, but I think they're very misguided and I think it will be something uh, that this country uh, will live to regret if we don't address it and we need to address it without any further delay. Yeah, and it does seem certainly this is an issue in America with the Mexican border and it's a massive big issue across Europe as well. Can I ask you about something else? In the last sort of uh, 20 minutes or so, uh, we have had a report uh, from uh, the, uh, it says the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman. They've been looking at the potential injustices of the pension, sta uh, the state pension age for women when that was raised not just from 60 to 65 but also then on to 66. Uh, millions of women obviously affected who didn't get their pension at an age they would previously be entitled to because 
that by definition what happens when you raise the pension age. Uh, one would argue, I would say, that uh, it was men who were uh, suffering the injustice for many years, having to work five years longer than women. However, there were certainly hundreds of thousands of women who were particularly hit six years later on their state pension age. They said they weren't informed in good time. Uh, they said, yes, OK, there had been a budget announcement, it was in the papers, but many years in advance. And actually, when they were planning for their retirement, planning out on their income, especially those on low incomes as carers and the like, they really didn't get the forewarning they should have had from the Department for Work and Pensions. This Ombudsman report says that, that women weren't informed soon enough, that the, the, the government was at fault, and they say that women affected by this change are owed compensation. Now, we could be looking at something like £10,000 per woman in compensation, but, but given that we are looking at millions of women, we are talking about multi, multi billions of pounds of, of taxpayers' money being given in compensation. Would you support that? Well, I haven't had a chance to read the Ombudsman report myself, so I will uh, refrain at this moment from um, commenting um, on any of the detail. But again, you know, this was a judgment that was handed down um, by the European Union. Um, they said that the pension age has to be changed uh, for uh, women um, so that there was an equality um, of ages. So again, this is, you know, a supranational body um, that was telling us um, how to run our domestic affairs. And there's a pattern here, isn't there? Um, we will see, um, obviously, whether there is compensation uh, that is paid. Uh, but um, I think this is an important uh, report. Uh, and certainly this has been an issue that has been um, a feature um, of uh, politics for quite some years now. Indeed, I, I think it was uh, one of the uh, issues that uh, was very prevalent at the last general election. So it's certainly been around a while. Yeah, indeed. But again, I've always been in the view that it's men who lost out for decades rather than women. There are always going to be losers when you change uh, the pension age at any point. There's always going to be the people who would have retired who then don't get to retire. That's what happens. That's, of course, what meant that government after government kicked this issue into the long grass and didn't raise the pension age when it was necessary to do so. Uh, to keep the public finances in order. Can I ask you just about one final issue? I'm sorry, this is the sort of thing that we shouldn't have to waste our time talking about, but I'm sorry, it does bother people, especially, you know, England fans uh, looking ahead to the European Championship starting in June. Um, a, Nike have issued in the last couple of days their new kit for the England uh, may, men, men players, and they've described this as a, a playful update to the St George's Cross. It appears on the back of the collar to unite and inspire. Um, Instead of a simple red cross on a white background, or just a red cross, which is what the St George's Cross is, their playful update, which unites and inspires us, apparently, Henry Smith, uh, is to have it sort of, sort of red vertically, but the longer, the longer horizontal uh, uh, bit of the flag is sort of a pink and, and sort of pale blue and look, either looks like either navy or purple. Um, I can't imagine there's any other flag that Nike would alter and it would be absolutely fine. This is clearly a sort of a vague, sort of pridey type look for the flag. What do you, as an MP representing, you know, English constituency, feel about this? Well, that isn't the cross of St George. That isn't the flag of England. The flag of England has existed for many centuries. It's one of the oldest flags uh, anywhere in existence uh, in the world, uh, and that is not the uh, symbol of England. So I don't know what that logo is, but again. You know, it's typical. It's um, people feeling that uh, if something is English, if something has a British heritage, then it can be uh, disrespected. And well, I, it's probably uh, racist, isn't it? There. The flag of St George is probably racist. You mean a load of racists as sort of appropriation of flag? We've been trying to bring it back for the rest of the nation. We sh no one, no one should ever be ashamed of their country's flag. But also, the whole point of flags is they are this imagery that, that is long lasting. You don't change flags. That's the you might change the bit of the kit, but you don't change the flag because the flag is the identity. That is what unites us. That is what inspires us. You're absolutely right, Julia. Uh, you know, um, it seems that uh, it's fine for people to fly Palestinian flags in central London. It's yeah. fine for people to fly uh, all sorts of other sort of um, 
multitude of color flags around, but somehow if you are um, flying the flag of England or flying the Union yeah. Jack, that somehow that is racist. I'm very proud of this country. This country brought democracy to much of the world, uh, has been um, has been promoting uh, liberty uh, uh, for centuries, uh, and I think that's something to be proud of, and uh, I certainly uh, fly the flag with pride, and I think our football team uh, should as well, and I think it's yeah. disgraceful that uh, companies like Nike um, have... Um, really um just completely changed our, our national symbol um it certainly won't well, change but it they've done it with think. permission from the football association it is disgraceful thank you so much henry smith there you've heard it nike it's disgraceful henry smith mp thank you for that philip ingram that's uh, still with us uh, in the studio now look look you've you know you've been on you know you've been involved in the military you know, the, the flag is you know people say they've like the country that they you know they're, they're the monarch the flag People feel very strongly about flags. You know, that's why you know burning flags is such an insult to people. I just don't understand Pe the number of people who this would have gone through. The number of people who've signed this off. The, the, the football association have signed this off. The, the, those in charge of the England team have signed this off. You know, the, the, Nike Nike only respond to the brief that they get and the brief they're allowed to get away with. Yeah. You know, the flag is a rallying point well, in battle. But, but this is the funny thing: is people say, oh, "Why are you getting upset about a flag?" And it's like, oh, you know. Uh, and yet there'll be the same people, by the way, who constantly fly that blue flag with the yellow stars on. I can never remember what it signifies. But anyway, <laughs> today we are asking about the government's flagship Rwanda bill. It's suffered yet more defeats in the House of Lords. Do you have any faith in the Rwanda deportation policy? That's the question I'm asking. Give us a call, 0344 499 1000. Text 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Daniel says, if the government were serious about stopping the boats, they would have stopped them by now. Rwanda's just a distraction. Rob says, absolutely none. What so Ever. And Roger says, smoke and mirrors, look at this, and then don't look at how many visas are being issued from around the world. Exactly. That's in their control. So they want it like this. It's a fair point. Uh, you've also been getting in touch on the phones. Let's go to Bob in Tyneside. Hello, Bob. Hi there. Hello. What do you um, want to say about yeah, this, then? I just wanted to ring because I fully agree with this Rwanda policy. I, I sort of think the only country that sort of managed to stop migrants in the tracks is is Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, at, at the beginning, there was, they were coming in there from Indonesia, and it, it would have changed the whole culture of, yeah. of Australia. And uh, most of the migrants that were coming in weren't refugees in the, in the proper sense. They were economic migrants who were out there to raise... Yeah, but the, key thing, but the key thing, Bob, that policy, the policy worked because you never set foot on Australian territory. You were, you were in the sea, you were taken, and you were taken straight away to an island where you were processed. You were told you're never going to set foot. These people are literally on the beaches at Dover. Yeah, I mean, basically, that, I should imagine that's right. Australia's policy was to put them in camps on a couple of islands in the north and the people didn't get onto it under our well, we're not doing that so do you think rwanda's ever going to work that a couple of years after you arrive here you might have your tiny chance of getting sent to rwanda look i mean i don't know it depends on what, how the government runs the policy all i can say if you're an economic migrant and you you want to be in a rich country and get higher wages and get more economic benefits and you're stopped at the sort of shore when your boat gets there, and you're sent off to an island camp where you sort of where the refugees are sorted out, whether they're real refugees or whether they're just economic mm. migrants, then, then that might be a deterrent. If we did that, I'm, that that might actually work. Bob, thank you so much for your call. Appreciate that. It's Bob calling in from Tyneside. Coming up after the break, we're going to be talking uh, more about that uh, breach of the Princess of Wales's private health records. This is Talk TV. I'm Julia hartley -Brewer. Stay tuned. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. 
then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement. If you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you are with Talk TV. Now, three members of staff at the private hospital uh, where Kate uh, Middleton was treated for her abdominal surgery are now under investigation for allegedly trying to access the Princesses of Wales private medical records. Uh, joining us in the studio uh, right now, I'd like to say, is the Talk TV's Royal Correspondent, Rupert Bell. Lovely to actually see you in person. I didn't get to bump into you at Cheltenham on Friday. Well, uh, doing my other job as a race commentator, but back Just to Just in the... case you're wondering, he's much better at the racing commentary oh. than the Royal... <laughs> 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 Lovely he's to gonna, see you, Julian. He's <laughs> going to kick me under the... You know me, he's going to kick me under the table. Yeah, Billy King, Philip Ingram, of course, also here with us. Um, <laughs> But this is, I mean, we talked about this on the show yesterday. Mm. This is genuinely outrageous. That anyway, I don't care whether you work at the NHS or some yeah. fancy private clinic, but accessing people's health records, either because you're nosy or you want to sell them to someone, is an abominable thing to do. Abominable. And obviously, the, for the London Clinic, it's deeply embarrassing. Yep. And for the CEO, particularly when you think the London Clinic is all about um, high net worth individuals who probably want to go there thinking my privacy, my yeah. health is going to be absolutely in, in off limits to anybody else. Yeah. And so it's not a good look. So the CEO, no doubt, will have some questions to answer because it's not just one. If it's three, yeah. then three you're, of you're, his you're staff... Gonna, have there's always going to be wrong one, yeah. one wrong one. But again, if three people work together... But this is the thing, you know, were, was it just like, oh, I wonder what she's in for, I wonder what she's had yeah. done, let's see her medical records. Again, that's still appalling and, and um, totally unprofessional. But if they were actually being asked by, you know, I mean, again, media organisations in this country would not be allowed to use that information, no. would not do that. That is literally, that is the end, end of your career and, your, frankly, your freedom. Um, but um, we know that around the world there are unscrupulous websites, that, you know, the, 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 the paparazzi who do the long lens shots of someone in private property. This sort of information could go for big money. And this is the problem, because we, we have no control. If some uh, overseas organisation wants to get it, and there yeah. is a, a high level of curiosity as to what is wrong with the Princess of Wales, that it's always some employee probably felt, oh, God, I'm going to earn a few quid here, and yeah. has tried to get around the system. So for the London Clinic, it is bad, and actually, it's I just hope it never happens anywhere else. Uh, too. I, you mentioned the NHS. Yeah. No one wants. Oh, we to know. It. No, we know. We know it does happen. We do mm. know that. But, but again, 
that it's fascinating that they didn't try and access the king's medical records. It's interesting. There isn't as much, you know, much much money in that apparently. It seems very bizarre. But actually, he's told what he went in. He's been given more. So he was more. We don't know what kind of cancer he's got, mm -hmm. but at least we know he's got cancer and he's not been working in a public capacity, yeah. although he's carrying on in a private There's way. There's been much more mystery surrounding yeah. Kate, hasn't there? Mm -hmm. Do you think, look, I'm teasing because he knows his stuff, he's got very, you've got better royal contacts than most people <laughs> who claim to be royal commentators as well, I know. But <laughs> in terms of how the palace has handled this, we spoke to a former press mm -hmm. secretary to the, to the late Queen uh, on the show yesterday, Simon Lewis. Right now, what would you have done differently? You know, this thing, did they, I, I thought, look, she's going in for planned abdominal surgery. Mm -hmm saying that it's abdominal surgery and then saying we're not going to say you anything else and she's not going to, she's going to be out again after Easter, you know, end mm. of. And I don't know about you, I'm thinking, well, fine, fair enough, that's yeah. it. No, no, get on with it, you know, if you have the recovery time that you need, blah, blah, blah. It, was it unrealistic of them to expect, though, that a lot of people who were obsessed with the royals, for whatever reason, would accept that length of time out of the public uh, eye and that little information? That's been the problem. And I think the Kensington Palace press office now need to take a look at sort of how they... It's crisis management, isn't yeah. it? And they've got to review how they dealt with it. Look, Did they create the crisis, though? <laughs> to some extent, they may have done that photo Should they slip some more stuff out, more pictures out earlier? I, but William is fiercely protective of his wife's privacy. Yes, and well, it, and it again, comes from him. Good luck with that, yeah. is my response, unfortunately, that, when you're in the public eye that way. That is the problem, because they have a public responsibility. She hasn't been seen since Christmas Day. Yeah. But it clearly, whatever's been wrong with her, it is has been bad. Yeah. So we have to accept but that on Facebook. But it's her... It's her sodding business, yeah. not ours. That's the thing. Is this a problem, Philip Ingram, with the sort of the celebrification of the royal family, particularly the younger royals, where people say, well, I get to know everything about, you know, a Kardashian or, or, or some other Hollywood film star. I, mean, I, don't, I still don't know what the Kardashians do. Um, <laughs> but I know exa <laughs> exactly. Um, but so, so I think I've got a right to know about Kate. I, 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 think, I think it is. And it's not just from a UK perspective, it's this global perspective that's in there um, because it creates global interest. Uh, and that's something that I don't think the palace has quite got in their, their, their comms plans that mm. are out there. But I've got a slightly different view on the, on the hospital. I mm. think, actually, if anything had been accessed, it would have been out there on the black market already. Already. Um, and the hospital has actually identified people... And they said they attempted they to do, access. So... Attempted access and stopped it from happening and are investigating. So that's a good way to say they're I suppose, protecting or Even though we records. didn't hear about it immediately, I don't think we, I, mm. the fact that we know about them this at all is probably a good thing. I think it is a good thing, because the Palace would have known about it, that this has happened, yep. and you just hope that the um, CEO has done the due diligence and mm. it basically dealt with this problem going forward. He's got, he's got to work out now, build trust again within people going to the London Clinic. Yeah, but again, like, where else yeah. are you going to go when, mm. you know, I, I said at the time, go to the NHS, everyone said no, they want their privacy. Well, there we are, that's what's happened. Uh, really great to have you here in the studio, Rupert Thank Bell. You. Thank you very much indeed. Coming up in the next hour, uh, more with Philip Ingram and more on the government's Rwanda bill suffering defeats in the House of Lords and the BBC's DG accusing campaigners of whipping up outrage over the BBC's coverage of trans issues. Yeah, because it's all in our minds. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! <laughs> it's carry on. What just happened? <laughs> Worm is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Brewer. You are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Where have you been in the last hour? Coming up in this hour, the government's flagship Rwanda bill has suffered a series of defeats in the House of Lords. Could see deportation flights delayed until June. I'm wondering if you have any faith in this policy at all anymore. Plus, women affected by increases to the state pension age are, are owed compensation. That's according to a new ombudsman report out today that found the Department for Work and Pensions failed to adequately communicate the changes, even as they were in all the papers. And the BBC's Director General Tim Davies accused campaigners of whipping up outrage over the BBC's coverage of transgender issues. Yes, Tim, it's all in our minds. None of it ever happened. I've got a bridge to sell you as well. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Oliver whitfield Beatrice. Thanks, Julia. Good morning. The government suffered another series of defeats over its flagship Rwanda bill after the House of Lords passed seven proposed changes. Among the amendments is a provision to ensure due regard for domestic and international law. It means MPs will now have to vote on the bill again, which will delay the whole process until after Easter. Political commentator Benedict Spence told Talk TV the latest developments doesn't come as a surprise. They wanted to avoid this precisely because it is a very sticky issue. There is one benefit that they can take from the planes not taking off is that he can turn around to the electorate and say, look, if it's Labour next time around, you're not going to get anybody being deported. There's not going to be a fix. You need to give me more time to try to, you know, to try to solve this issue. I don't think anybody's buying that. A new report out today has warned that the NHS needs a cash boost of eight and a half billion pounds a year to tackle the service's current crisis. Health experts say Chancellor Jeremy Hunt's pledge in the spring budget will still leave the health service £32 billion short of cash. Former NHS doctor and broadcaster Dr Arma Khan has told Talk TV that we need to do much more than pump cash into the service. I think, you know, what we need to be looking at is not just throwing money at the NHS, but how we can restructure it, how we can become more efficient, mm. and also how we can engage other agencies like the food agencies and um, other organisations that have an impact on our health as yeah. we move forward. Mm -hmm. And I think the responsibility goes way beyond just the NHS for good health. A highly anticipated report on the impact of raising the retirement age for women born in the 1950s has recommended providing them with compensation. Campaigners said millions of women had suffered financially as they were not given sufficient warning to prepare for the change. The report also said that the Department for Work and Pensions should acknowledge its failings and apologise.
The Bank of England is expected to hold interest rates at 5.25% for a fifth time in a row later. Despite yesterday's lower-than-expected inflation figures, the bank's advisers remain cautious about indicating when future cuts might take place. Meanwhile, official figures show that government borrowing was higher than expected in February. A new survey claims that the majority of parents believe the government should ban smartphones for under-16s. 83% said they felt they were harmful to children and young people, according to a survey by the charity Parentkind. It warns that society has sleepwalked into a position where children are addicted to devices. And we told you about the brain chip that Elon Musk's company had successfully implanted into someone's head. Well, now Neuralink has released the first video of the patient who received it, apparently playing a game of chess using his mind. 29-year-old Nolan Darbor was left paralyzed below the shoulder after a driving accident, but now he can control a computer mouse using only his thoughts. It just became intuitive for me to start imagining the cursor moving. Um, basically, it was like uh, using the force on the <laughs> cursor and I could get it to move wherever I wanted, just stare somewhere in the screen and it would move where I wanted it to. You're all up to date here on Talk TV. Now time for a look at the weather with Isabel Lang. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Well, the weather is set to turn colder tomorrow. Not great news, quite a chilly weekend coming up. It's behind this cold front here that's gradually bringing some increasingly wet and rather windy weather southeast was across the British Isles. Ahead of it, it's still in the mild air, though, and there will be some sunshine to uh, end the day across the south with temperatures up into the mid to high teens. But it's not particularly pleasant under the wind and rain across Northern Ireland, Southern Scotland, Northern England, and that wet weather will continue to sink steadily southwards this evening. Behind it, blustery with showers. And we'll find that increasingly chilly air coming in across the northern half of the country through tonight. Maybe a touch of frost, but definitely some fairly hefty and possibly wintry showers there. Many central areas keeping this zone of cloud, rain and fairly brisk winds, though, that will gradually push its way down towards the southeast later in the night. It does mean that if you're out first thing tomorrow, there will be some pretty persistent rain for a time, particularly stretching from the southwest up into the South Midlands, then the home counties in East Anglia. That rain, though, gradually pushing away through the afternoon. And then for the rest of us, it's a bright and breezy end to the week with sunshine and showers, but definitely turning chillier. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you are with Talk TV. Still with me, running through all the top stories, is Philip Ingram, former senior military intelligence officer. Lots to talk about today. Um, in an hour's time, we are going to get those interest rates uh, decisions yes. from the uh, Bank of England. The decision is made, obviously, on the Wednesday. We find out at midday. Likely to stay at 5.25%. Um, still very high. A lot of people in the city, we're going to talk to uh, a guest later on in the show, saying look, it needs to come down more, especially with inflation falling from 4% to 3.4% heading the right direction to get back to 2%. Bearing in mind, prices are still going to be going up. They're not mm. going down. They're still going to be going up. Your chocolate Easter egg, he's not bothered about chocolate Easter eggs getting smaller and getting more expensive. The rest of us are, I'm sure. Um, the Prime Minister yesterday told MPs that 2024 is the new economic moment. Are you feeling this? Well, not in the slightest. And I think you know, if we're down to economic moments after 14 years of the, of the government in, then they've missed a trick in some, in some way. We, we need to see sustained movement and a lot of the issues that we keep blaming on the government if you look at across Europe the Europeans are suffering exactly the same way this this is something that is a global issue that, that's hitting us but people are using it just to, just to beat the government up with yeah I mean I mean that's the thing we, we should we shall see but again I wonder if it'd be any different to under the alternative options available to us, uh, which I'm not entirely sure would be the case. Um, let's also talk about some breaking news in the last hour or so, which is about the WASPy women. Hmm. Uh, people haven't uh, uh, heard of uh, them. Uh, those are the women who were affected by the uh, state changes to state pension. They are the Women Against State Pension Inequality. It's a long-running campaign for many, many years now. Um, and the new report from the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman uh, has uh, basically ruled that, yes, 
they were not told soon enough that their state pension age was going to change. This was the decision. Um, and, and it really was, uh, you know, a, a long time ago, a law passed in 1995, setting out a timetable to raise the age uh, for retirement for women up to what men were retired. So women were allowed to retire at 60, men at 65. They were moving the retirement age for both to 65. And then, uh, just a couple of years later, it was going to be moved to, to 66 for both. So that meant there were a number of women who, born in the 1950s, I think, who just basically were very unlucky and <laughs> happened to be at the moment where they would have had a pension at 60, and it was 66. Now, some of those were on very low incomes. They were carers. A lot of those women of that uh, age group didn't actually have, you know, occupational pensions because they were carers for their children. That was the norm for women then. Um, but um, they say, look, we, we, we knew we had enough money to survive until our pension at 60. And then, you know, a year or two, or even a month before we were going to retire, we discovered we were going to retire in six years' time. Now, this was public information. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that anyone who had bothered to do what they talk about there, pension planning, would have maybe done a cursory check on when their pension age was. They say, we weren't told about this. We weren't sent letters about this until very late in the day. We've lost out and we want compensation. The Ombudsman, crucially, has ruled that some of these women do deserve compensation. However, we are looking at millions of women affected mm -hmm. by this. It, it's something There was some talk about £10,000 per woman. Now... You know, we're talking about billions of pounds of taxpayers' I'm, money. I'm, I'm, I'm sure the Ombudsman hasn't looked at this from a holistic perspective, looked at it from a very, very narrow perspective of you know, just how the rules have changed and what communications have happened. But when you look at it from a holistic perspective, you're women who are often um, uh, not, not working because they were looking after children were still yeah. getting their... Um, uh, state pension contributions made so yeah. they haven't been disadvantaged in any way from that perspective. So we're talking about then wider pension planning that's in there and how do you then define how that fits in within the changes that were mandated by the EU and that everyone wants when yeah, it comes to Yeah, this was an EU, this was a rights. European court judgment about equality. Because quite clearly it's unfair that women are allowed to retire five years earlier than men. So, so possibly compensation. The, the government should then turn around and say, EU, you impose this on us. We're going to sue you for the money. I'm not sure that's how it works. I, think, I, I think an awful lot of men who were forced to work for an extra five years, especially, by the way, when men live less time than women. Women live longer and can yeah. retire earlier. I've always thought that was unfair. It seems to me whenever you make a change in the pension age, by definition, there's going to be a cohort that are going to feel that they've been unfairly treated because if they'd been born a day earlier, they would have been able to retire. Yep. There's, at some point, you have a cut-off point, and that yep. cut-off point... Is, uh, but also, I mean, a lot of these women, look, there were women who were on very low incomes, who were impoverished. I can live with compensation for a number of those women to help them get by and deal with debts and things. In, you know, maybe, you know, uh, maybe that's a few thousand, maybe it's a couple of hundred thousand, who knows? But the idea that... Well, we made a change in the law to make it fairer, not just fairer on men as well as women, but also fairer on the younger generation who are paying the contributions to these pensions. Um, we're going, you know, we, but, 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 but because you were affected by it, which by definition, of course, someone would be, we're going to compensate you. Rather defeats the object of the exercise, doesn't it? Yep. I mean, I've got to be honest with you, I'm 55. I'm, I'm doubtful I'm going to be retiring at that age. Yeah, I don't think any of us are going to be retiring until I mean, we're well into our 70s, I suspect, in what's going on. And, and you know, in many cases, would, would we want to? Yeah, keeping the brain ticking over. But you know, this, this, Apparently this is... Apparently it's very bad for you, retiring. Uh, allegedly. <laughs> um, I, I know a lot of people who've retired and they seem to work harder when they're in retirement yeah. than they do when they did when they're at work. But, but again, this is... I think this is a symbol of... You're too many people expecting too much and too much of a handout the, the, whole, the whole way through. I think lots of things have changed. And you know, I can't see this coming in anytime soon because you look at the hiatus there is over getting the compensation to the um, post office postmasters. Yeah. You know, that's taken 20 years. So, you know, those in the, the, born in the 1950s add another 20 years yeah. on. There's not going to be many left. Yeah, exactly. Um, look, let, let's also talk about the Rwanda policy. That's my question to you today. The government's flagship Rwanda policy is uh, stuff suffered yet more defeats uh, in the House of Lords uh, last night. Seven defeats now. Uh, those who are ten amendments previously, they were overturned by the Commons, uh, by MPs voting... Oh, excuse me, elected House of Commons uh, on Monday night, and now the Lords, unelected, appointed peers, uh, have decided to overturn seven of those. That means it's not going to be passed before Easter. That was the plan, because, of course, Parliament goes into recess. I don't see why, frankly, they can't do, just have a day of... They, do, they don't need to have a long way. It's like, like here, we're going to put these all into one, change those amendments, back, and then... Um, have an inset day, just you, to you get this in, sorted. Yeah, do you remember the inset <laughs> yes. day, exactly. But I want to know, do you 
have any faith in the Rwanda deportation policy? Maybe you never did. Maybe you did, but now you don't anymore. Do you think any flights will ever take off? And do you think it makes any difference if they do, if the number of people who ever be flown to Rwanda is frankly less than the number of migrants who get on boats and arrive on our shores on a, on a sunny Sunday? Uh, give us a call on 0344 499 1000, text on 8722, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. I have to say, I'd like this policy to get through. Do you know why mainly? So I don't have to talk about it anymore. <laughs> don't worry. If, <laughs> I mean, that's when, literally when, it now. When the, when the policy gets through, it's going to go to the courts. So we'll be talking about it for at least another oh, six months or the, more. For the you know, love of done God. Deliberately. For the I, love I, of God. Yeah, who who, who, who can protect the government? The year, doing this the year is 2035. <laughs> Welcome to talk. Um, let's talk about uh, the, Rwanda the Rwanda policy. <laughs> <laughs> I can absolutely see that. Uh, Do you have any faith in it? Um, I don't. I, you know, I've, I've faith that planes will get off the ground with some people on it, but it's tokenism. Um, and unfortunately, it, it is something that affects a lot of people in the country. People have got their views on it, but the views to turn it around um, are just not practical. They're, they're, yeah. they're illegal. And I've heard, last night I heard an interview with the senior um, Labour Party lead on this, um, and she turned around and said, we will, um, anyone that doesn't pass the asylum, we will deport back to whence they came from immediately. Well, if yeah. they came from Afghanistan, we Can't. don't fly to Afghanistan. If they came from Syria, we don't fly to Syria. And are they going to kick them back to France? I don't think so. No, exactly. Um, but we have got the issue, of course, we're paying a fortune to look after these people. Yep. There was a ridiculous suggestion from Justin Welby, the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, along with other faith leaders, and we were discussing on the show yesterday about how where we have jobs which can't be filled, there the, the shortages, um, we should allow people who have come here on this boat to, to work from day one. I mean, genuinely insane. Like, yeah, here's, here's another one. Why don't we just give them all a mansion and a Ferrari? It would be cheaper. It would be cheaper and have done with it. But um, this ties in with... Um, Mel Stride, the Work and Pension Secretary, he's uh, uh, spoken about how mental health culture has gone too far. Yep. Uh, he says, it, you know, again, we've gone from talking about it not enough to talking about it too much. And he says, uh, normal anxieties in life are being labelled as an illness. And he's speaking as he unveiled plans to get uh, 150,000 more people signed off work with mild conditions to actually look for a job and stop writing them off. I mean, I'm all in favour of these policies. I just think it's probably, you should probably do that with a million and a half rather than 150,000. Mm. Um, but he is quite right, isn't he? And I think this, is, this goes from children onwards. I can remember just things like my daughter, you know, if she fell over when she was little, even if she, just, you know, she falls over and you go, oh dear, give it a rub, there you go, up to Daisy. And then, and then you, you only say up to Daisy when you're a parent of a young child. <laughs> and, and then when she went to nursery, they had to have like a, this, these sort of ice cold things from the fridge. Does you have to have the ice pack on it? And, and, and there'd have to be a letter a write about it. And you think, would, You've made a graze and a little fall into a big deal, so they think it's a big deal. And then every anxiety, you're anxious about your exams, your boyfriend's dumped you, it carries on. And then you don't want to go to work on a Monday morning, you've got depression. We, we have just medicalised and made a drama out of every normal aspect of life. Yeah, la labelised everything. And the trouble is, those people that are properly suffering from a lot of conditions. Yeah. And, and, and if you are properly suffering, it is debilitating. You tend totally. to be the silent minority. Um, everyone else with the label, it's, the, the labels are almost being worn as a badge of honour in many places. I think it is. I think a lot of, particularly young people, think that their mental health condition, whatever it is, is, um, is, is, a, is, is, is the most interesting thing about them. Yeah, well, and I, I like I, to say, it rarely is. And, and you see that in some of the parents' culture and, and you know, people that then later on in life get into the public eye and they, yeah. they then have to come up with the you know, three-letter and four-letter abbreviations that, oh, I didn't realise I had A, B, C, D, E, F, G and yep. um, X, Y, Z and all the rest of it. And that's other people that's should be ashamed if they do, but I, I, A, I just don't think it's interesting about you. It's, it's not so, relevant. You know, it's, 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 not it's not relevant most of the time. And it shouldn't be used as an excuse, because actually, I know, you know, people who genuinely do have, yeah. uh, you know, people who have either physical or mental disability uh, or, or ill health, and actually they don't want to be, yeah. they don't want I, I, to be I, seen as that. They, they labels... fought not to be seen yeah. as just that label. Yeah. They are, and they and they and they fought fight just to be seen as someone who's just as able to do their job or, or live their life. And they, and it's. It's just an excuse culture, isn't it? It is, and all these labels de you really detract from those that are genuinely suffering and genuinely need help because yeah. the help is being spread too thin then and not targeted against the individuals who actually need it and you can Absolutely. make a real difference. Can I also talk to you about the uh, senior, most senior civil servant in the land who, who's, you know, occasionally at work. Apparently he's had some ill health problems. Um, but the Cabinet Secretary, Simon Case, we heard a lot about of him uh, around the time of Partygate because, of course, he was in... The, uh, uh, Downing Street when these parties were happening, um, you know, walked into some of them at a time, but uh, and it was chosen that um, 
that Susan Gray should uh, do the investigation into Partygate because he <laughs> couldn't, because he'd been at one of the parties and his staff were at the parties. I mean, why he's still in a job, absolute mystery to me. I think he was over, uh, you know, over uh, uh, appointed anyway and, and, and over promoted. But he's our chief civil servant. He has now resigned his membership from the Men Only Garrick Club. This after um, the, a, a list of the members was released uh, uh, by the Guardian newspaper. It includes the King, the Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden, and the head of MI6, Sir Richard Moore. Sir Richard Moore has also resigned from the club. Now, there's been quite a big thing for a long time about this members only mm. club, uh, which is men only. There are plenty of clubs that are men only or women only. Most of those clubs actually have largely opened their doors to, to those of the opposite sex. Um, and the key issue about these clubs over the years has been that are these the places where the decisions are really made? This is where powerful men meet up and you become a member and then you get access to these men. Women can't become members if they don't get access. It's why they're not in quite literally the old boys club. They don't get promotions. They don't, they don't get, to, uh, get to influence policy and the like. And that's why these clubs shouldn't be men only. But the thing I find fascinating about this is this is a man who's overseen a civil service that is absurdly woke. I mean, it's just non-stop, isn't it, about diversity and inclusion and trans this and women that and all of that. Here he is, a member of a club. It's basically a club for posh, white, straight men. Mm. Well, I checked the Garrick website just before we came on air. Um, and they do allow women into the club, but they don't allow them in as members. Um, I couldn't find the membership criteria that are in there. But, you know, he's... The head Being of civil, a bloke. He, he's, he's, the, he's the head of the civil service. He, he should have known what this would have looked like in today's society. But, and, but then, and but then stand by it. But like, if you're going to be the member, stand by it. Now, he's yeah. genuinely... I love... I, you've got to love this guy for putting up this argument. <laughs> he has genuinely argued. This is... I mean, this is beautiful. I'm going to read it out as well. I have to say, my position on this one is clear. If you believe profoundly in reform of an institution, by and large, it is easier to do if you join it and make the change from within in rather than chuck rocks from the outside and by the way maths is also part of this every one person who leaves who is in favor of fixing this anti-diluvian position every one of us who leaves means these institutions don't change i think when you want reform you have to participate so so why have you left them mate also can you show us some evidence that as soon as you were a member after getting your nomination and your seconder as soon as you remember i assume you did start the process for pushing for women to become members well, uh, and you know, what he's just argued against is um, Brexit as well, because you know, we were a member and then we came out and we're throwing rocks from the outside, yeah. according to his his words. So you know, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very tosh, naive, isn't it? yeah, very naive statement for the senior civil servant to make. It's because he's not very good. Yeah, I think I think if he was very good, our civil service wouldn't be as bad as it is. Well, this is this is where you know, everyone's expecting huge amounts of reform whenever the government changes at the end of this year. Uh -uh. The civil service isn't going to change. They're the people that bring in the processes that the. Yep. Have to come in, that everything else comes in, nothing is going to change. Yeah, that is the concern, isn't it? Really is. Well, one thing that has changed, nice lead in on that, thank you very much, is the New England kit. There's always a new kit ahead of a big championship. We've got the European Championships uh, happening. Well, they're actually kind of all over Europe this time around, which I don't, I don't really like. I think I like it being one country and really focused. But uh, Nike have released their new kit and it's just deep sigh time. It's cool to, here you go. A, a, well, they've done one thing in particular. A playful update to the Cross of St George appears on the collar to unite and inspire. Now, describe it to you if you've not seen it. It's on the back of the collar and we all know what the St George's cross looks like, don't we? It's really, really simple because it's a red cross, yeah? And it's normally seen on a white background, but it's a red cross. Otherwise, it's not a St George's cross. That's kind of the giveaway. So it's not red anymore. The vertical bit uh, is, is red, but the... Uh, the, the horizontal bit is, is now pink and pale blue and, and looks like navy blue, possibly purple, uh, from what I can tell. Um, clearly, you know what's going on here. This is clearly a little bit of the pride flag, isn't it? I'm surprised they haven't just made it full on Black Lives Matter, <laughs> queer plus T, whatever the hell, all these words they use, uh, nonsense. Um, don't mess with the flag. I mean, if you want us to feel inspired, they say, and united. We are inspired by our, our England team, whether the men or the women, when they play for us, mm. representing our country. And they, they do that representing our flag for our country. Don't change our flag. 
the colours and battle are what the, um, the armies rallied around um, and focused on, and it was out there to capture the opposition's colours. It's the same in sport. You then mess with the colours and yeah. you're messing with the whole, whole putting, cycle. I mean, putting, you know, we've seen in Ukraine when the Ukrainian forces putting up that magnificent blue and yellow flag, or turquoise and yellow flag, uh, you know, recapturing... Uh, the, the, the towns. And we saw, you know, the, the Russians do this, you know, putting the, you put flags on the moon. These things are, they have a significance. It's why, you know, countries have laws against burning flags. They matter mm -hmm. to people. They're a symbol of your nation. But we're the only country they mess with the flag. As I was saying earlier, I'd love to see them do this with that sword on the Saudi flag. Yeah, good luck with that, guys. It's amazing, isn't it? Because the, the trans flag sort of stuff, which they, you know, the pride flags that they put all over everything in, in, in Western nations, particularly, you know, Britain and America. But it never appears in, in Asian countries or in Middle Eastern countries or in most African countries because they know people will just go, what on earth are you doing? Well, exactly. We're two walking things. Well, maybe next the Scottish Psalter is going to you know, come out in pink or the, or the, or the Welsh dragon is going to turn into a pussycat or something different yeah. because, you know, we can, we can just change things as we It's like. so painful, isn't it? Um, just also, just sort of briefly get in, just because I like the pictures, but if you're listening, I will describe <laughs> them for you, lucky, lucky things. Emmanuel Macron. We think probably ahead of European elections, he's destined to not do very well in at all uh, in June, uh, that uh, he has put out a load of pictures of him trying to look well like the strong man of Europe, isn't he? He's very much very... Busy. And they have pictures of him boxing, looking very sweaty and very muscly. His tiny little <laughs> arms, he's a tiny little man. I could fit him in my pocket. Um, but looking, I have to say, very hunky. I don't know, I'm probably being sexist. Feel free to complain to Ofcom, but he looks pretty hot in this. Now, this, though, is quite clearly inspired by the pictures we've seen from Vladimir Putin, I, I'm, I'm, where he's on a horseback. Yes, with, with the shirt off, with the shirt, shirt off, off and everything else. I mean, it's not personally a good look, but uh, he's obviously going for that look. I tell you who he's not inspired by, Keir Starmer. Uh, does anyone <laughs> remember these pictures from 2021 of Keir Starmer in his white, school, in his white uh, office shirt, boxing... I mean, it's the... It, 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 guys, I mean, if you are listening rather than watching, you're lucky. <laughs> You've locked out of this one. It's not. It, I mean, he can barely make the the punching bag move. It's terrible. The punch bag move. Yeah, Mac Macron is trying to look strong domestically because he's got elections yeah. coming up, and that's why we're getting the the rhetoric out um, uh, about French troops into Ukraine. And these pictures are coming out in a very Putin esque way, and look strong in uh, an EU way as well because we've got EU elections coming up in May. Yeah. Um, so he's 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 trying to put that out. I wonder how many takes it took to get those. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed. Philip, uh, more from you uh, coming up. Now let's uh, find out what you're thinking about the government's flagship Rwanda bill. It suffered yet more defeats in the House of Lords last night. That's seven more amendments to put in. Back on, back on the table, which the, the Commons, the elected Commons, by the way, the, the people we actually elect to represent us, not the peers who are appointed. Remember that little difference? Uh, they, they voted them down on Monday. So I want to know, as this looks like it's being delayed again, do you have any faith in the Rwanda deportation policy? Simple as that. Give us a call. 0344 499 1000. Text on 8722. We'll get in touch on X at Talk TV. Gav says, yes, but I have no faith in the House of Lords. We hear to that. Carl says, here is a better idea. Stop handing them our country's benefits. And Ruth says, not at all. Total waste of taxpayers' money. You've also been on the phones as well. Keep those calls coming in. Let's go to Chris in Hereford. Hello, Chris. Hello, how are you? Hello, very well indeed. What do you make of this? Uh, do you still have any faith at all? No. Did you ever have any? No. <laughs> Short call, thanks for your call, though. <laughs> no, Chris, yeah. why not? No, just seriously. Um, the thing is, uh, this run, if this gets voted through and they start pe 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 putting people on planes, oh, in October, when well, the Conservatives or Will will, will lose the election, the Labour Party will probably scrap it. Probably scrap it uh, when they. They haven't. The interestingly, I think they haven't said whether they are going to or not. Because, I, I, but again, well, it doesn't achieve anything, does it? No. Do you think no, the principle matters, though, that a democratically elected government with a majority of what about sixty in the Commons should be able to enact policies they want to enact, whether the unelected peers or the unelected courts want it or not? Yeah, as I said, it, it is, it, it's just. It it's just it's like it's coming like going to and from with the Lords and the House and Commons and all that, and in the end, I, I think the House Commons will, will approve it anyway, won't they? Will yeah. they approve it if, if it gets? Who knows? By the way, the guys in my have just pointed out Keir Starmer has said he would scrap the Rwanda um, plan, even if oh. it succeeded, even if it actually had cut small boat arrivals. He has said. 
that he would dump what he calls the hugely expensive policy, even if it had been successful. That, that's quite an extraordinary thing, isn't it? Yeah, I think as I said, it, it's just a waste. It's a waste of money. I think it's we're just it, we're just still going around in circles and circles at the moment. Okay, I think I think a lot of people agree with you on that, Chris and Hereford. Thank you so much. Coming up after the break, we're going to talk about the WASPy women, women affected by increases to the state pension age, are owed compensation. That's according to a new ombudsman report out today. They found that the government failed to adequately communicate the changes. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You are with Talk TV. Now, women who've been affected by increases to the state pension age are owed compensation. According to a new Ombudsman report out this morning, they found that the Department of Work and Pensions had failed to adequately communicate the changes long enough in advance, leaving many women destitute. Joining me right now to discuss this is Becky O'Connor. She's Director of Public Affairs at Pension B. Uh, good morning to you. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, now, this has been ongoing a very long time. When I say the, the WASPy women are those who basically led this campaign, and they are the Women Against State Pension Inequality, known as the WASPy women. They say millions of women suffered financially because they didn't get sufficient warning to prepare for the change in the pension age. We've got this Ombudsman report basically backing them and saying they do deserve compensation. But let's roll it back a little bit. When was this pension change announced, and, and how did it affect people, and how many did it affect? So it came with the Pensions Act of 1995. Um, the change actually took place in 2010. So, there, you know, there was some lead time there. The estimated number of women 
been affected is around 3.8 million. And according to this Ombudsman report, um, the amount of compensation is, well, around £10,000. So um, uh, per, the, woman. <laughs> per woman affected. Yeah. Now, you know, we don't know the, the, the full details of how that's going to play out yet, because the actual investigation by the Ombudsman has been going on for several years now. They have, have already published some findings back in 2021. This is kind of like the final ruling that we've, we've been waiting for, looking for the compensation details. Yeah. And they have said that they actually don't want to just put this to the DWP because they don't think the DWP is going to follow what they have recommended in the report. So they're putting it straight before Parliament now. But basically, it's been going on for many years. The campaign has been going on for many years. So has the investigation. And we've reached a conclusion, but we haven't actually got, got money, money into the pockets of those women the who the Ombudsman says has been affected. The key thing here, I've always wondered why there hasn't been a campaign by men to say we'd like to be compensated for the fact that we had to work five years longer than women for decades, uh, retiring at uh, 65 instead of 60. Um, why have they not been compensated? No one's offering to do that. That was clearly unfair and it was unclear for, unfair to far more people for far longer. It was obvious to me and anyone you, that it was unfair for women to retire earlier. It was a European uh, uh, court that said, you know, this is unequal, it has to be changed. There was no choice about that. It had to happen. And then, of course, the government's decision to raise pension age from 65 for both men and women to 66 meant that a particular group of women born in a certain few years in the 50s were hit by the six-year, you know, hit change in one go. Clearly, that was a big change. Now, their argument is that we didn't know about this in advance, even though these changes were made, they announced well in advance. Now, they were announced in budgets. They were announced in the newspapers. I remember, you know, I remember, you know, writing about these things, reading about these things. Uh, it was well known. There is an argument that, you know, a lot of people don't pay attention to the news, what happens in Parliament, and they weren't aware. But a lot of these women are saying, look, you know, I wasn't, wor I, I wasn't working or I was in very low paid work. The pension was going to be, I could work at or I was a carer. And I was going to basically eke out my money until until my pension age, and 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 therefore I, I you know, and then it it was six years longer. But most of the women in this age group would have been able to carry on working just as men carry on working. So why, what do they need to be compensated for? Um, well, for some women who were already working, who had some private pension provision. The, the increase in the age from 60 to 65, you know, they weren't too worried about it. They were fine because they were planning on continuing to work anyway. It's those women who had given up work, who had a certain expectation that they were going to receive the, the state pension at 60, um, who maybe would have struggled to get back into work for whatever reason. Maybe they were yeah. still caring. Maybe they just weren't able to retrain. Um, these are the women who have suffered the most and have had to use food banks and so on. But you you are correct. There are there are some women who weren't affected, who would have carried on anyway. And with regards to the equality between men and women, I mean, yes, in theory, completely fine that we should retire at the same age. But it was this transition period mm. that is in question. And I think, you know, it was 15 years notice enough for people to make up the shortfall? Yes, of course Depending on your was. income. Possibly but, not. But, but the thing I find fascinating is women. I've got. I've argued with quite a few of the women from the Waspy campaign over the years on there and uh, and uh, on Twitter. Um, and they'll say, "Look, we weren't given notice. We didn't know." But we were doing our pension and our retirement planning. I'm thinking, you were doing planning and at no point thought to double check. By the way, this was still in the age of the internet. It's not like it was sitting in the library and you had to go to the library to find this information to check what age retirement age was. A simple Google would have made them go, oh, hold on a minute, I don't think I do retire at 60. I think it's 65 or 66. I, I'm sure there are probably a couple of 100,000 women who were in dire financial straits, who were working as carers, doing fantastic work, which, by the way, unpaid work, which the state would otherwise have to pay for, who will need some help and should have been given help at the time. Um, and all, 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 you know, absolutely support that. But the idea that the vast majority of women who were affected by this or in any way harder hit than all of the men who worked for five years longer, who probably many of them, many years, never actually got to actually claim their pension because they were still working when they died at 65. Um, I think they've got, a, they've got a better claim than these women have, haven't they? So the state pension age for women was the same between 1948 to 2010. It was 60. So women grew up just with that assumption. Now, the Ombudsman has said that, you know, these women should have been written to individually rather than having to pick up the news from the news. Um, as you say, it was publicised. There was mention of it several times. But clearly that 
information did not filter through or did not filter through with people then actually able to consider the implications for them individually yeah. and then they might have been aware of it but think but that's got nothing to do with me because I'm not thinking of retiring right now completely and there may have been a bit of dissonance there there may have just been you know genuinely complete lack of understanding um, and you know sometimes we are expected with things like you know our tax bills to know ourselves what we should be doing and how we should be planning our tax finances and so on. Um, and in this case, that logic was applied to changes to the state pension, but it didn't filter through, which is what the Ombudsman has found. Um, there was a lack of accurate, adequate and timely communication. Now, would a letter in the post have changed anything? You know, perhaps some was would still have been in the same position had that letter well, been that's, received. That's my but the point is, we won't know. I do. I mean, I do. One of, the, one of the biggest problems we do have is actually that most people don't make plans for their, 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 their pension years. They don't know many details about it. Most people are under some um, complete illusion about what they're entitled to, how much they need to pay, and what sort of pension pot they they need. Um, and we often talk about you know, gold plated, you know, even state sector pensions. I mean, you know. If, certainly for people who, who've uh, still got rent to pay, if they haven't bought, they've been lucky enough to buy their own home and a mortgage that's paid off, you know, it's not going to even cover people's rent. A lot of people have no idea about their, their financial planning. Oh, you're so right. So the state pension, most people do rely on it for the majority of their pension income when they retire. It's, you know, probably not enough to rely on, particularly if you have housing costs, as you say. Um, and private pension provision is, is necessary in order to get us up to at least a moderate living standard when we retire. But there is this issue with personal responsibility and understanding that our retirement savings now more than ever are our own responsibility. Um, that, you know, we don't have defined benefit schemes to the degree that we used to have that were fairly generous and paid a, an income based on final salary. Those are falling by the wayside. Um, and the state pension age is likely to rise further. We already have a fairly unsustainable state pension system, Indeed. which means more than ever, it's on us as individuals. Absolutely. Becky O'Connor from Pensions B, thank you very much indeed, for joining us. Hope you come on the show again. Still with me is Philip Ingram. Um, Philip, look, I mean, as she said, you know, the pension age is probably going to change again. I mean, the reality is, when the pension age was originally set at, at 60 for, 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 for men, it, it was, that was actually around the age that people mostly lived to. Yep. Very, you know, very few people actually claimed it. Now people are, I see, I know people who are retiring in their 50s, they're expecting to live another 40 years. It's unsustainable. Yeah, completely. And you know, th there's a few things in there that we, I think we need to correct. 15 years worth of notice, it was more than that because it takes time to debate this through Parliament, so that will have been plastered all Most over the Most people papers. don't follow debates in Parliament well, and, in their and, defence. And, and, They've got live. But, but, you're working as a carer but, but for the, someone. The, you're not spending time exactly, looking at that. Exactly, but the news will be putting lots of stuff out there. And, and a lack of understanding when it comes to this is, is an apathy with that your people, I think, need to realise that you do have to look at what you're doing for the future mm. and start to put some planning into it and yeah. not just expect... Well, exactly, when people say their pension plan, my thing is you clearly weren't doing any planning it was just a shock to you because you yep. weren't doing any planning but again they could have done the department of work and pensions should have done and could have done more either way to inform people the amount of, God, the amount of letters you get about nonsense you get more notices about a, 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 a package being delivered from yep. from you know from from you know, yep. fedex or anybody else than you get about things like this so maybe there does need to be more information but again i don't think most women affected the whole point was women were supposed to be affected. They were supposed to carry on working and not be retired. They were supposed to be... That was the I, point of the yeah, policy. I, I remember the debates they at shouldn't the time, have... and there were, there were lots of debates. Yeah, no, yeah, again. The awful thing is a lot of people don't pay attention to us. What can mm. I say? Anyway, <laughs> today we are asking about uh, the Rwanda policy because the government's flagship Rwanda bill has suffered yet more defeats in the House of Lords last night. Seven different amendments passed by the unelected appointed peers after our elected representatives in the Commons uh, defeated them uh, previously. I want to know, do you have any faith in the Rwanda deportation policy? Maybe you never did, maybe you did, and now you've given up. Give us a call, 0344 499 1000, text 8722, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Stephen has done that and says it was only ever a decoy. Ray says it was never a viable plan. And Pete says just take them back to France and deal with the consequences. You've also been getting in touch on the phones. Keep those calls coming in. Let's go to Paul, who is in okay. Bristol. Hello, Paul. Hello, Julie. Hello. What do you want to say? Well, just about this Rwanda business, um, a complete waste of time. We're spending millions of pounds, hundreds of thousands, millions of pounds trying to get this through unelected um, members, peers that have yeah. got no interest whatsoever. We've got the ch ways of doing it to, to stop it. 
Firstly, that they could stop all these boats being imported through Spain, through the borders, on the, the trucks and everything else. Well, hold on, we can't do that. We don't control... I mean, No, but the European Union can. They've been do, doing this. They, We're paying France millions of pounds to. to stop it. We're paying fr France millions of pounds to, to do something. Yeah. They're doing nothing. Yeah. So what the government should be doing is to say, grow, grow a pair and say to the French, we will take away your fishing license to fish in the channel. You will not fish anymore. Yeah. The French farmers are up in arms when everything goes wrong in there. You get tractors yeah. coming through Paris and everything yeah. else. You Here, if you stop the boats, the fishermen will do exactly the same. Do you know and what? They, I think that would actually work. Philip Ingram's yes. looking... He's, he's got a very what, big smile on his face. Thinking that, that, will, that would work. I mean, and basically, just return... Basically, say, if you don't deal with it, we're just going to return the boats to you and, and tough. We're going to bring got, them back we, to your waters if you don't deal yeah. with it. We've got, we've, got, we've got army, we've got navy... Spend a bit of money buying bigger inflatable uh, boats for us with high-speed motors. Get out in the channel, turn them back and tow them back into the French waters. Paul, thank you very much for that. Very brief word from Philip Ingram. Will that work? Uh, no, it won't work, unfortunately, because it, it's, it's illegal and, and the practical... Re, um, uh, if people start jumping it, in the it, water or something. Ex ex exactly. It's virtually impossible to do. Well, um, say, well, why can't but, we just pick them up, take the, pick them up on the boats, and instead of the boat going to, the, the, to the, the, the British side of the channel, the, the boat goes to French yeah, waters what, and then drops them off what, there? What, what I don't understand... Why can't is, they do that? What, is that what, illegal? Um, it would be very difficult practically to do without potentially causing injury. But what I don't understand is you know, we keep hearing and... and um, Wait a minute, we tell them this. they're in France. Well, exactly. So we tell them they're in Britain. We go, no, no, this, they won't notice that the boat just yeah. goes round a few times. But, no, no, we're dropping you off in Britain. They get off on the beach <laughs> and you go, ha ha, you're yeah, in Calais. Yeah. Well, you know, we, people keep quoting the European Bill of Human Rights. France and Germany are deporting people immediately without all this fuss, without all yeah. the legal bit. Th the same Bill of Rights applies to them. We just need to get away we from need all to have of this a will. debate. Absolutely, do it. absolutely. Coming up after the break, we're going to talk about something different. The BBC's Director General, Tim Davey, has accused campaigners of whipping up outrage over the BBC's coverage of transgender issues. Apparently, it's all in our minds. Is it? That's up next. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're on Talk TV. Hey, very good. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media, having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to <laughs> just, yeah. for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brew, and you are with Talk TV. Now, the BBC's Director General Tim Davey has accused campaigners of whipping up outrage over the BBC's coverage of transgender issues. Yes, Tim, it's completely all in our minds. We've just been making it all up. Of course we are. Uh, well, look, let's uh, talk uh, right now uh, to defund the BBC's campaign director, uh, Rebecca Ryan, who joins us. Hello, Rebecca. Hi, Julia. Thanks so much for joining us. I mean, it is extraordinary. Um, that, that Tim Davey has made these comments. He was speaking to MPs yesterday and he said he'd only received a handful of emails uh, about one particular row that's uh, come up recently. And this is about the uh, Radio Today Radio 4 presenter on um, uh, uh, Justin Webb. And he, last year, a whole year ago, uh, used the phrase on today's programme when he was talking about trans women. He said trans women, in other words, male, and just carried on the conversation. One person complained and... Very quickly, this, this, this was dealt with. And uh, he was found to have, basically, to have uh, e e effectively, you know, taken a side on a controversial issue. We know that a lot of senior women at the BBC have gone, it's not controversial to state facts. Trans women are male. He didn't even say, are men. He says, are male. They said, well, maybe if he said biologically male, that would have been okay. That's what male means, biologically male. Um, I'm pretty sure, knowing Justin Webb, that he's fairly unhappy about this, um, as indeed are a lot of other people. But according to Tim Davey, he'd only received a handful of emails about this and the controversy has been whipped up around us in a way that is deeply, deeply damaging. At the same time, by the way, John Humphreys, who used to be a presenter on the same show, uh, suggested uh, that uh, uh, actually uh, the, the organisation um, Stonewall has more influence with the BBC than it does in the outside world and is an issue. What do you make of this? Is it all in our minds? Are we just whipping this up and it's just not an issue? I mean, we see this on a daily basis. It clearly isn't just in our minds, is it? We see this in BBC's news reporting. We see it in the, the broadcast coverage. You know, this, um, you know, a, a woman has been accused of, you know, has been convicted as a paedophile. You know, these things are, yeah. these words are being... Um, misused all of the time and it's really dangerous actually isn't it and what we see is the BBC taking one side on what is a is a contentious issue but also it's just it's just science it's just fact you know and what we expect from the BBC in order for them to be allowed to tax us essentially with the TV license is journalistic excellence so that means that they, they should be dealing in facts and they should be able to deal with um you know these sort of issues where there are two sides who are at loggerheads and essentially what this comes down to is the bbc bowing down to a, a small but very very vocal very um, very vocal <laughs> campaign group um and throwing out you know the views of half of the country uh, are women basically it, it's it's yeah. not it's not wrong and it should not be offensive to people to say that, you know, a, a trans woman is male. You know, no, that's exactly. Or even a trans woman is, is, is a man because they, they are, that, that's what they, I, I have to say. I mean, I think we should stop using the phrase trans woman, actually. I mean, because mm. lots of people actually think that not they, not as a as a belief that that, that person be, somehow becomes a woman by saying the magical words, I am a trans woman. I, I am a woman, therefore, you know, I, I am one. Um, uh, but actually, they actually genuinely think that's what people are talking about, or someone who's been gone through yeah. all the operations, as opposed to you know a six foot bloke with a beard saying, "Oh, I'm yeah. I'm a woman today." Um, we yeah. should say trans identifying men. That's what yes. they are. They're men who are identified as trans. It's completely accurate. Mm. Um, and yeah. I don't think we should say biologically male. I think we should just say male. And I think we should stop doing this. But we also need to stop saying um, trans, you know, gender critical feminists who believe that men cannot become women. No, who know 
that men <laughs> cannot. We need to start using more factual language. We were all trying to be nice and kind for a long time and using people's preferred pronouns because we didn't want to upset anybody, quite rightly. Yeah. And then people who are not either genuinely trans, uh, uh, in, in, you know, they're not people who are suffering from, from um, the trans dysphoria, uh, gender dysphoria, I, I, I've started exploiting it. We know, you know, all these men who, who are charged with or convicted of rape um, of mm -hmm. women saying, oh no, it turns out I'm a trans woman, I put a wig on and, and, and I really need to be in a woman's jail and things like that. I mean, we need to stop playing along with the madness. And what I expect of the BBC, who I'm legally required to pay for, because I want to watch live telly, um, is that they stick to the facts. And the facts are, trans women are male. Um, that's yeah. literally what it means. Um, yeah. And for, for Justin Webb to have been basically wrapped on the knuckles is an extraordinary thing. I wish he would kind of stand up publicly and go, I won't put up with this. I didn't do anything wrong. But of course we know his job would disappear if he did that. And that's what happens to women who speak out as well. Absolutely. And that's the thing is we've got this state broadcaster, as you say there, that we are forced to uh, fund if we want to watch any live broadcast TV, um, who are being complicit in this lie, basically, this gaslighting of, of the British people yeah. to sort of say, you know, th this isn't happening or that's happening. And what it comes down to is, is surely being able to state facts um, and, and this is a debate, as, as we've said, where one side is, is very, very vocal and got very sharp elbows and has, uh, as, we, as you mentioned earlier, through the sort of Stonewall network, has got a massive amount of influence over the public bodies in yeah. the UK. But they really do, um, though. Not, they really do. Yeah. Mermaid, Stonewall in particular, they are, they're basically running our country these days. Absolutely. And this is the thing. And you've got women who are just sort of... Um, <laughs> trying to go about their lives and suddenly they're called, you know, people with cervixes or they're called, yeah. you know, we've got chest feeding and you're getting sort of women who are being eradicated from, from public discourse because, you know, somebody might get offended and that's just really insulting. Honestly, um, I don't care if someone gets offended. It's like, and I'm sorry, I don't care anymore. We're going to use the words that we've always used. Can I also yeah. ask about JK Rowling just very briefly? Uh, because obviously she's been a hero on a lot of these issues and just basically coming out fighting sort of Boudicca, so type of figure but Scottish police police Scotland uh, at an official hate crime event again don't even have time for hate crimes um they basically created a fictional character called Joe oh what as in Joe as in JK Rowling who thinks that thinks that sex is binary and bizarrely calls tra for trans people to be sent to gas chambers I mean it, it, this apparently was a youth engagement event held in February as part of their LGBT history month I mean what is going on? Again, we pay for the police as well. What is going on? I mean, there's a complete capture of all of these sort of uh, state mechanisms where you've got these sort of LGBTQ plus um, groups within these organisations who are essentially just cobbling together training material. Yeah. Um, and know, making out money. Of They're yeah, making exactly. money from it. Making That's what I guess. They're making money. Indeed, and pushing this agenda, and it's, it is a nonsense. And I think within those organisations, you haven't got people who are able to sort of say, hang on a minute. This, well, they you are, know, they are able to say, but if they say it, they lose their jobs. That's what people yeah. understand. <laughs> this is what is happening. I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you so much, Rebecca uh, Ryan there from Defund the BBC. Uh, very just quick word, very quick word from Philip on this. We've got a minority dictating to a majority. That has to be wrong in any yeah. society. Well, exactly. I mean, again, but also they're wrong. I mean, they're wrong to say trans women and women. It's, it's a factually incorrect statement. But people being told off or sacked for stating facts is very scary. And inequality is flipped. We've now got inequality against the majority because if they speak mm. out, then they, yeah. then they get sacked. Absolutely. Philip, thank you very much, Dee. Coming up in the next hour, we'll bring you the latest on the interest rate decision for the Bank of England. And uh, we'll talk, by why, uh, sorry, talk about why more than half of parents support a complete ban on smartphones for under 16s. So this is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, Trico. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. 
trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. I'm with you live from 10 until 1. I, I say this often, but where have you been the last two hours? And you've only got an hour left of the show, but coming up in this hour, more than half of parents support a complete ban on smartphones for under 16s. There's a new report by a charity that claims smartphones and screen use is ruining children's eyesight and mental health. Plus, a committee of MPs has claimed that new rules requiring people to show photo ID at polling stations will see up to 8 million people at risk of losing their right to vote at the next election. And the Bank of England is announcing their latest interest rate decision. And uh, we have... Uh, I, sorry, someone's just saying in my ear, maintained. The uh, interest rate level has stayed at 5.25%. Uh, this comes after inflation fell to a two-year low of 3.4%. Rishi Sunak boldly claiming that 2024 will be the year the economy bounces back. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Emily Rose Adams. Thanks, Julia. Good afternoon. More than 500 migrants crossed the English Channel on Wednesday, the highest number so far this year. Home Office figures reveal that 10 boats were intercepted, carrying 514 people. Over 4,000 migrants have made the journey so far this year, about 10% higher than the same period in 2023. Well, despite the Prime Minister's repeated pledges to stop the boats, the government has suffered even more defeats to the flagship Rwanda bill. The House of Lords passed seven proposed changes yesterday and said there needs to be due regard for international and domestic law. It means MPs will now have to vote on the bill again, which will delay the whole process until after Easter. Times radio presenter James Hansen has told Talk Today most people have come to terms with the facts that flights won't be taking off. The public don't expect to see these flights taking off anytime soon, if ever. MPs aren't surprised. I think the government privately will admit they 
you know, if they get one flight off between now and the election, whenever that is, they'll be very happy. But you're right, you know, there's a huge backlog, and it does make you wonder why, from a bureaucratic point of view, can't we clear it? And in fairness to the government, on certain things, remember the passport office had massive issues a few years ago? Yeah. If you renewed your passport, you couldn't get one for months. They've cleared that now. A new report out today has warned that the NHS needs a cash boost of £8.5 billion a year to tackle the service's current crisis. Health experts say Chancellor Jeremy Hunt's pledges in the spring budget will still leave the health service £32 billion short of cash. Former NHS doctor and broadcaster Dr Arma Khan has told Talk TV that we need to do much more than just throw money at the problems. I think, you know, what we need to be looking at is not just throwing money at the NHS, but how we can restructure it, how we can become more efficient, mm. and also how we can engage other agencies like the food agencies and um, other organisations that have an impact on our health as yeah. we move forward. Mm. And I think the responsibility goes way beyond just the NHS for good health. To some breaking news now, and the Bank of England has just announced that it will hold interest rates at 5.25%. Despite yesterday's lower-than-expected inflation figures, the bank's advisers continue to remain cautious about indicating when future cuts might take place. Meanwhile, official figures show that government borrowing was higher than expected in February. A highly anticipated report on the impact of raising the retirement age for women born in the 1950s has recommended providing them with compensation. Campaigners said millions of women had suffered financially as they were not given sufficient warning to prepare for the changes. The report also says that the Department for Work and Pensions should acknowledge its failings and apologise. And a new survey claims that the majority of parents believe the government should ban smartphones for under-16s. 83% of mums and dads felt that they were harmful to children and young people, according to a survey by the charity Parentkind. It warns that society has sleptwalked into a position where children are addicted to devices. That's all the latest. Now it's time for a look with today's weather with Isabel Lang. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Well, the weather is set to turn colder tomorrow. Not great news, quite a chilly weekend coming up. It's behind this cold front here that's gradually bringing some increasingly wet and rather windy weather southeast was across the British Isles. Ahead of it, it's still in the mild air, though, and there will be some sunshine to uh, end the day across the south with temperatures up into the mid to high teens. But it's not particularly pleasant under the wind and rain across Northern Ireland, Southern Scotland, Northern England, and that wet weather will continue to sink steadily southwards this evening. Behind it, blustery with showers. And we'll find that increasingly chilly air coming in across the northern half of the country through tonight. Maybe a touch of frost, but definitely some fairly hefty and possibly wintry showers there. Many central areas keeping this zone of cloud, rain and fairly brisk winds, though, that will gradually push its way down towards the southeast later in the night. It does mean that if you're out first thing tomorrow, there will be some pretty persistent rain for a time, particularly stretching from the southwest up into the South Midlands, then the home counties in East Anglia. That rain, though, gradually pushing away through the afternoon and then for the rest of us it's a bright and breezy end to the week with sunshine and showers but definitely turning chillier. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you are with Talk TV. Philip Ingram is still with me in the studio. We're going to be talking about interest rates with the economist in just uh, a couple of moments. Um, those interest rates being held at 5.25% by the Bank of England. Lots of people calling for them to be cutting those interest rates, especially after inflation uh, fell from 4% to 3.4% in the last month. Uh, but there's actually interesting new development on Rwanda as well. Um, I'm asking you about the Rwanda policy. This as I was just deep size, really. It's emerged in the last half hour that 500 migrants made their way across the channel uh, on Wednesday. It's the highest number so far this year, not the highest in a day. That's been over a thousand. Philip Ingram, I mean, we're talking about a policy that, that, that is going to see at best a few hundred people being sent to Rwanda. Mm -hmm. At best. And 500 in 500 today. arrived, yeah, just, yesterday. just yesterday. Yeah, yeah it's extraordinary. It, 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 it is extraordinary. Um, you know, how, how we're going to solve this is it's, it's not just government policy. 
No, bigger, it's got to be more than that. Yeah. Well, we've been asking about this. I mean, we're going to be talking about this for decades. <laughs> this is going to still be the biggest issue. It's the biggest economic issue, actually. It really, really is. It's big demographics. It's, it's everything. Housing, it's schools. It, this hits on everything. But my question is about the government's flagship Rwanda bill. It suffered yet another set of defeats in the House of Bills last night. I want to know, do you have any faith in the Rwanda deportation policy? Maybe you never did. Maybe you did and now you've lost faith. Maybe you still have faith. It's the game changer. Is it about principle rather than the practice now of MPs getting to have their say? Are elected representatives having their say over unelected peers, unelected judges? Do give us a call. 0344 499 You've got just less than an hour to get those calls in. Text on 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text cost one, standard network rate message. Right now, let's go back to that interest rate decision in the last couple of moments. Bank of England has announced that it is holding holding interest rates at 5.25%. This, as Rishi Sunak last night boldly claimed to MPs that 2024 will be the year the economy bounces back. Well, joining me right now is independent economist Julian Jessup. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much indeed. Well, look, after that good news mm. on the inflation front, heading back towards that two percentage rate of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of inflation that the Bank of England is actually, that's their job to get to, we are in better territory when it comes to inflation at 3.4%. There was a little scintilla of hope that that might have meant that the meeting of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England yesterday, they made the decision on the Wednesday, they announced it on Thursdays at midday every time, that they might possibly consider an interest rate cut. Do you think they should have? Uh, well, first of all, yes, I would have cut rates today. Indeed, I probably would have cut rates several months ago. The, the key point is that monetary policy is supposed to be forward-looking. So although inflation is above the 2% target now, um, looking ahead, it will drop below 2% in April because of what we already know is going to happen to domestic energy bills and probably remain below 2% over the rest of the year. So there's no really good reason to keep interest rates as high as they are now. Um, that said, it wasn't a huge surprise that the, the bank didn't move today. Um, indeed, at the, at the last meeting, there were still two members who voted for an increase in rates. But Sorry, are the good you news kidding me? Because we, we always find out money. afterwards, don't we, that the, how, the, how people voted. Two, two, well, we now, we now know basis? that those two members actually voted to leave rates on hold today. So there has been a shift in the balance of okay. opinion on the Monetary Policy Committee. We had eight votes for no change today. Only one for a cut, but I think that will change over the next few months. Yeah, but this is the thing. A lot of people are saying that actually they were too late bringing in the interest rate rises and then they went too high and now they're too slow uh, bringing in those cuts. Mm. But I never really understood what the need was for the interest rate rises anyway, because that's if there is this sort of spiral in the economy and, you know, wage growth and inflationary costs that, that can actually be tempered by interest rates here. Whereas, whereas actually they were all external. These were about energy prices hitting us from abroad, from a war that we, you know, we didn't declare and, and, and have yet to been able to end with our support for Ukraine and, and other issues. We, we're not in control of that. So what, is, what was the purpose of raising interest rates in the first place anyway? Well, my, my interpretation is a little bit different. Um, obviously, the, the prices that rose the most over the last few years were, were energy and, and food. You can point to external factors there. But the, the bigger picture is that the Bank of England had left interest rates at very low levels for a long period of time and also printed an enormous amount of money and pumped it into the economy during the COVID crisis. And that, I think, was the underlying cause of, of inflation. Um, so the bank shouldn't have done that. It should have been quicker to reverse that boost to the the monetary side of the economy. So it was too slow to, to raise rates on the way up. Right. Uh, now, though, the picture is completely different. So, you know, the growth in money and credit has basically slowed to zero. If you look at the level of prices, they've actually barely changed over the over the last few months. We're just dealing with the legacy of what happened um, six to 12 months ago. So I would already be voting to, to cut rates. Yeah. Uh, and indeed, other central banks have already started to do so. Interestingly, the, the Swiss central bank cut interest rates today. Now, Switzerland is you know, an open economy as well. They had exactly the same shocks from energy and food prices, but they didn't see inflation surge because they kept monetary policy well under control. So yeah. it didn't fuel the surge in inflation that we've had here. And there were all the fears, weren't there? And I, remember, I still remember the Bank of England, you know, a, a governor sort of talking about how you know, people 
shouldn't get wage rises because mm. prices were going up because, you know, that was going to be spiral inflation. Of course, they were quite happy to give bonuses to people working at the Bank of England. Of course, he was on, well, half a million plus. Although he couldn't, I always still love that. He didn't know what he actually earned, but he, it was in the region of. Um, and uh, it was so much, he, did, he just didn't know. And, uh, and that he, uh, and, and, but he thought it was, it was important, you know, someone like him wouldn't take a pay rise, but he didn't understand that people on, you know, average, in fact, even, pre, you know, above average wages, really saw their, their, their spending power squeezed by the mortgages or the rents going up and, and energy bills and everything else. And a lot of people, of course, used up a lot of savings during lockdown. Some people accumulated savings, but it tended to be either or, didn't it? Um, in terms of where wages are going to go, a lot of people have had wage rises. We've seen across the public sector, a lot in the private sector of having wage rises. But it never, those wage rises on average, unless you moved to a new career, a new job where they were offering super duper new money to get new people in because they'd lost a lot of staff. You, you, people have not largely seen wage rises that have covered all of the inflationary costs of the last few years, have they? Well, that's right. I think the, the Bank of England's comments on wages, not only terrible public relations for the bank, but I also think they're bad economics. We, we do need a period of a relatively rapid increase in wages because partly it's just catch up from the previous period when prices were rising much faster than wages, but also we've got labour shortages. And, you know, one of the ways to encourage people to get back into work is for them to be paid more. So um, I would be completely relaxed if I were at the bank uh, about what's happening to wages. Uh, but to the extent there are any concerns about sort of so-called wage price spiral, they should be fading anyway, because you know, the labour market is cooling. You know, the number of vacancies is dropping. More people are coming back into the labour market pay settlements are starting to fall. So if that is something the Bank of England is worried about, then I don't think it'll be worried about that for much longer. No, did but as you say, but they seem to have this, we talk about fiscal drag a lot, but they seem to have an awful lot of, you know, bank drag in terms of their decision-making. And what did you make of Rishi Sunak saying that, uh, you know, the economy was going to bounce back, this was the year on the right track? I mean, it's, I'm feeling quite sort of happy about life today. It's quite sunny, you know, walking along in the sunshine, the blue sky, it does try perk your spirits up a bit, but is there any evidence the economy does feel that way? Yes, actually. You know, as you know, the economy slipped into the dreaded technical recession in the second half of last year. So there were two quarters where the economy actually shrank in a row. But we've had plenty of survey indicators suggesting that the economy returned to growth in the first quarter of this year, including a, an important private sector business survey that came out this morning. Uh, and over the rest of the year, we should see more benefits coming through from um, lower inflation, you know, lower interest rates. I think the Bank of England could still start to cut rates as early as May. Um, and there are other positive things going on in the background as well. So, you know, big increases in national living wage and state pension in, in some forms of working age benefits. So I think this year will be a year of much better growth, um, but still well below where we should be. Yeah. I mean, but much still, better growth at the moment might mean 1%, but that's yeah. still pretty feeble compared to what it? we've had in the past. We, we still need to get people's confidence. You need business confidence to invest and employ people. And you, and you, but again, it shouldn't be a misplaced confidence. It's going to be based on the reality and the confidence... But we consumers. are starting to see that. There are surveys of both consumer and business confidence that are turning up. Yeah. Um, but they are very heavily based on this assumption of big falls in inflation and, and in interest rates. So there's still a lot of focus on the, the Bank of England being yeah. willing to deliver the cuts in interest rates that people are hoping yeah. for. But, but also that we don't have another shock, an external shock like we've had. I mean, goodness knows how... how uh, you know, uncertain our times are. Can I also ask you about council tax? Because then that's, everyone's been getting their council tax bills. Oh, what a surprise, they've all gone up. We've seen a number of councils, you know, Birmingham, you know, among the councils that have gone bankrupt, where they're seeing, you know, is it a 21% increase uh, in their council tax for fewer services? Although, of course, they can still pay to do all that, that woke nonsense, diversity stuff, but there we are. But the average annual council tax bill that's been announced today will rise by £106 this year. Um, basically, you know, the max is 5%. Yeah, everyone's putting it up by 5% for the average band D property. So the average bill is going to be, wait for it, £2,171, uh, with all of the 153 upper-tier councils applying for some or all of the social care precept 2%, so an extra 2% to spend on social care. Um, that's a heck of a lot of money for a, a lot of people. I mean, that is a huge sum. OK, people tend to pay it by direct debit, but... That, that is a big sum of money to come out of people's uh, um, take-home pay, isn't it? Yeah, I, 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 the government does have a good line that if you're on average earnings, you're paying a, a lower rate of tax on your income than you have since 1975. But that's partly, of course, because other taxes have gone up a lot, um, including council tax. So the burden is shifting away from 
taxes on income from employment, which I think is a good thing, but it's simply popping up somewhere else. So um, a lot of people won't see the sort of full benefit of these cuts in national insurance because they'll simply be spending the additional money on paying their council tax bills as well. Uh, and council tax is a particularly bad tax. It's what economists call uh, a regressive tax. You know, it has a disproportionate impact on the, the budgets of people on lower incomes. I think there's a strong case for reforming council tax, perhaps linking it more closely to what property values actually oh, are. Now, you know as well as I do. Of course there's a strong case for reforming council tax. It's absolutely absurd. It, I, mean, I know so the flat I have and our, my neighbour's flat, we pay the same council tax and our properties are vastly different sizes. And, of course, a lot of people say that. However, you know as well as I do, the government that decides to do this will face the wrath of all of the, all of the voters who do badly out of that change because the only point of doing that change will be to have people pay more. It's never, there's never going to be a change that's going to, we're going to make sure fewer people pay so much tax. It's going to be people paying more. And there'll be a few people who win, vastly more who lose, and they're going to be unhappy. And what they are going to do? They're going to blame the government that does this. It's one of, those, one of the reasons why this, like, pension reform and everything else gets kicked into the long grass. Oh, I absolutely agree with that. Planning reform is another good example because although absolutely everybody, including Rachel Reeves earlier this week, was identifying problems in the planning system yeah. as a key factor behind the housing that, prices, Rachel. nobody's <laughs> going to tackle that in an election year. No, absolutely. Julie, just a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Still with me in the studio is Philip Ingram. Um, are you filled with the joys of economic spring? Not really. Um, and, I got that from your body language. Yeah, and, and you know, I've been I've been following what the Bank of England have been doing for you know, years now, looking at their planning and everything else. And they seem to be, and, and comparing it to the, the, a lot of the commentary that we're getting in and the commentary that's coming from the continent, they seem to be um, holding back a lot. They're not don't seem to be planning as much into the future, mm. um, and they seem to be being you know, very. Um, they're responding to events rather than looking re ahead. Rea and, reactive, not proactive. And, 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 well, yeah. We know they're rubbish at forecasting. Everyone's rubbish at economic forecasting. I don't know why people bother doing it anymore, frankly. Yeah. Um, but but they, they seem to be reactive rather than proactive. And then they, and they, then, then they tend to go overboard, don't they? But things in terms of sort of consumer confidence and, and, you know, I mean, and, and business confidence, people need to be sure they're going to keep their job, that they can afford yeah. their rent, stay where they live. They need to be, you know, people, to get people out shopping, to get people... And I, I've never been that happy about the fact that so much of our economy rests on people going out and madly buying stuff they don't need. No. I'm not sure that is we, the healthiest way for us to run the economy, but but we're not going to kickstart everything unless there is some sort of level of confidence that people will go, yeah, I've got enough money, I can afford to go out and spend some money on hospitality, huge job yeah. market, or I can spend money in the shops. And, the, and there needs to be, you know, it, it all comes down to business confidence. We need to get that business confidence into the small businesses so that they can afford to employ more people. Yeah. Um, and the people, people they are, are literally go, the people go, who employ everyone pay, in this pay, country. Pay, pay, pay the taxes then. Um, and that, that will... But you see so many boarded up shops in my little high street. Look, there's plenty of money around, but genuinely, like those street, the, the, the shops, they pop up, they're open for six months, they close down again. They can't survive. And, and, the, and this, is, this is where your council tax, but it, it's the whole local financial planning that ties into town centres yeah. and everything. Everything else, you know, there needs to be a complete reform of that to incentivise bringing smaller shops and, and capabilities. Letting into people park centers. on their high streets would be a good idea. Yeah, well, I mean, I, that I, might help. I, I, and tax the big supermarkets that are making billions out of us so that those that are opening little shops in the centre towns can afford to do it. They, they, the big shops pay for it. The, the yeah, but again, you know, then everyone moves out of town and then we all have to do everything on Amazon. Eventually, why don't we just put... Why don't we just elect Amazon to be in charge of everything? <laughs> That's what it seems to be. Uh, um, Amazon and Stonewall. Put no, them in charge of everything. Uh, they run everything anyway. Amazon, Stonewall and Facebook, they know everything about it, so they <laughs> done, are running everything done, anyway. Yeah. Done, done. <laughs> Let's start the conspiracy theories off. Uh, Philip, thank you very much, Dean. Now, I'm asking you today about the government's flagship Rwanda bill because we, because we, we are contractually obliged to talk about that for the next million years. Uh, it has suffered yet more defeats in the House of Lords. I want to know, do you have any faith in the Rwanda deportation policy? Did you have any faith? Do you still have any faith? Give us a call, 0344 499 text 87222, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Phil, not this one, says, what is the point in a scheme that's going to cost us billions, and it will end up costing us billions, won't it, when keeping them out would be a fraction of the cost? Wendy says the government should cancel Easter recess and sit until the bill goes through. I completely agree with you. As Philip suggested earlier, you know, at school, those teacher inset days, 
Have an inset day. Get it through. Get on with it. And Marilyn says, that's why it doesn't matter who is Prime Minister or what party is in government. The way Westminster works, the Lords can hinder law laws, which they can. They can hinder, but they can't stop the law. Yeah. Uh, some of you have also been getting in touch on the phones. Keep those calls coming in. Let's go to Jonathan. He's in Bournemouth. Hello, Jonathan. Oh, hello, Julie. Hello. Um, hi, how are you doing? I'm Not just, very well. Lovely to have you on. Just, do you have faith in this policy? I do, actually. Do you know, um, just before I um, go back to I was in I was in a car park in France in January with my French friends, and I overheard um, a gentleman of about 65 or 70, a French gentleman, saying, um, oh, I've heard the British are sending um, a lot of migrants to Rwanda. Why doesn't France do that? I actually overheard this uh -huh. French gentleman say that, you know. I don't know if the French are fully aware of that we're doing it or, or we're supposed to be doing or, it. Or whether that we haven't really actually well. done it yet. But do you, <laughs> given, given that the news has emerged in the last hour that 500 Channel migrants came and arrived in this country on yes, yesterday, in one day, that's the highest number this year, about half what we've seen in other years as peak, you know, in the middle of summer. Um, we've had 500 arrive in one day. We're talking, yeah. uh, best case scenario, by the end of this year, there won't be 500 migrants sent to Rwanda. It's not even one day's arrivals. No, no. Look, Julia, you know, it's clear to us now, is it? The will is just not there. There's not enough will. Why the isn't there? Because if there was... Why? It, well, this is it. This is it. I mean, you can, see, you, know, you can talk about the usual cliches, can't you? Like, they don't really care about, about the average person on the street. They're out of touch. Um... You know, I'm getting these petitions by email. You're probably getting them as well, Julia, from organisations like Liberty and Change. Yeah. You know, and obviously these are honourable organisations, where well, we hope they are. And they're, they're saying to me, oh, sign our petition to stop this inhumane yeah. Rwanda bill. And I'm thinking, well, why is it, why is it inhumane? Yeah. What's inhumane about it? You know, why does this island have to take on and absorb you know, endless swathes of people from all over the place. Well, that's what everyone that's in it. Europe is saying, that's what the Americans yeah. are saying, and then everyone shouts racist, bigot, xenophobe at them, and people are just saying, yeah. we, we've only got so much space. Well, this is it, and any other solution, any other solution mm -hmm. apart from um, taking everybody, endless amounts of people here yeah. in this country, is considered inhumane and unacceptable. Yeah. But there, has to be, there have to be other... Yeah. solutions and other options absolutely but, with you all um, the way you know it's it, it's inhumane so i'm not signing those petitions because why is it inhumane Julia? absolutely and again they use that sort of emotive language it's great what's inhumane is uh, is is what the people traffickers are doing putting these like people's lives at risk uh, thank you so much for your call really appreciate that I didn't want to ask what he was doing in that car park in France. <laughs> Jonathan, thank you so much. Uh, coming up after the break, more than a half of parents support a complete ban on smartphones for under 16s. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. We'll talk about that up next. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Brew, and you are with Talk TV. Philip Ingram's still with us for the rest of the show as well. Just some breaking news before we go to our next guest. You may indeed want to comment on it. The uh, Conservative Party candidate for the Greater Manchester mayoral election, of course, being held on the 2nd of May, along with London mayoral election and other uh, major cities' uh, elections, has defected to the Reform UK Party. Dan Barker uh, was selected as the candidate back last December, uh, but the Reform Party has confirmed that Barker will now stand as their candidate at the mayoral elections. Not quite sure what the Conservatives uh, are going to do to find another candidate there, but just a quick reaction from Philip Ingram to that news. We've had Lee Anderson defecting. We've been told in the last uh, couple of days that actually uh, some talk that Rishi Sunak is going to be allowing some of the uh, Tories who've uh, had the whip suspended for various accusations of wrongdoing basically get it back to not, not encourage them to also follow suit after Lee Anderson left as well. But losing, losing your Conservative candidate to the Reform UK party just, you know, a matter of weeks before that uh, mayoral election. That is quite a coup for Reform UK. A huge coup for Reform UK. And, and they're, they're pulling this out of the bag at every time. I think you, whenever they first came uh, around, people were laughing at them too much. Um, they are getting very serious. And they're now only four points behind the Conservatives in the latest poll, I understand. They're, yes, oh, they're, they're odd polls that they... Come, yeah, when the yeah. boys are really down. They there's, there's certainly are creeping up. But yeah. clearly, yeah. Uh, it's clearly uh, posing they're, they're, a threat. They're, they're, they're a stalking horse that I think both main political parties need to be um, mm. uh, wary of. Well, indeed. Well, I'm going to bring this up with our next guest who joins us in just a moment now. Uh, more than half of parents say they support a complete ban on smartphones for under 16s. A new reporter by a charity claims that smartphones and screen use is ruining children's eyesight and their mental health. Uh, joining me right now is Conservative MP and co-chair of the new Conservatives, Miriam Cates. Uh, good afternoon to you, Miriam. Name Julia. And now, I can't hear you. Are you on your mute button or we have problems? I'm... Miriam, can you hear me? Oh, we've not done this again. Like we had this earlier in the week where... My camera... Miriam, would you be a sweet to help carry on speaking so I can just see... This, everyone yes, can hear I'll it apart from speaking, me in the studio. Julia. This happened the other day. And certainly, very, I've just, just very, very, done all the technical right. checks with your team. Okay, I'm going to talk to Philip uh, while we try and okay. make sure we can actually hear you because... <laughs> I find interviews work better that way. They, they do. They it, do. It helps if you I mean, I do yap person. a lot, but it'd be nice. <laughs> you definitely want to hear what Miriam has to say, particularly also about this uh, mayoral candidate. Now, while I was reading that out about the mobile phones, you were nodding your head then. I, I, I don't think children should be allowed smartphones okay, in any way, shape or form because you can't control what they're getting access to. Um, they can be, uh, and they are being manipulated, the apps that the ch children particularly like to get to. Uh, and we know that those apps are um, having effects on, on children's mental health and their behaviours yeah. and everything else. Yeah. You know, we, when we grew up, there were no mobile no. phones. It didn't... Although I think us. often it's the parents. And I, you know, you, I hate it when I sit on the train on the way home and I see a parent, with, often with quite young children, the parents on their phone, the kids on their iPad. I, I've got to be, you know, I don't think you should have ever, ever see a phone or an iPad before the age of three, certainly. I mean, there's, there's loads of evidence yeah. that this is bad for their brain development. Also, yeah. they're never going to find a book interesting after they see big flashing in, in, you know, images. And I'm afraid those big flashing images 
aren't as useful to you as the ability and the love of reading. Read. Um, uh, but there is this thing, I mean, we gave our daughter a phone, I think when she was in um, uh, the final year of primary school, wanted to walk to and from school. And I, again, like all parents, you get a bit paranoid. I, it's crazy, but like, have a phone. But we gave her, you know, a kind of a, an old brick, effectively. I was going to say, give them but, the brick but, phone. But, you know, when we sort of had one of my old phones, yeah. but we, we just, we, but I don't know how to do the stuff, the IT husband does it, but dismantle. So literally the only thing she could do was was make a call or send a text message. Yeah. Um, no, uh, certainly no, uh, and none of the other stuff, um, Insta or anything like that. At 13, when she was allowed to go on those, yes, but with private accounts. But I have to say, most of the time, she and her friends, they use their phones to call or message each other to find out what time we're all meeting up later, yeah. which is which yeah. is healthy. I, I think we may have Miriam Cates back on the line and actually be able to hear her. Uh, Miriam, are you there? I am. Can you oh, hear me? No, I still can't hear her. I don't know what is going on. Let's take the whole system down. Um, just really why don't we just put her on the phone and she can just speak to me on the phone and then I can <laughs> call me and then, <laughs> then we can just do it. We're going to persevere. We're going to persevere. Miriam, play, bear with us. I'll carry on talking to Phil. <laughs> We're going to do our best. I mean, Te technology's not there to help us, they're technology. to blame. I mean, um, and, and therefore, we, we can blame the technology, you know, the mobile you know phones, on, on child behaviour. My favourite time that, that something like this happened is when we were talking to a government Hello, minister... Hello, Julia. About can an, you hear me? ...years back on The Breakfast Show, about an announcement about um, how we were going to be, they were going to improve uh, broadband communication <laughs> because so many phone lines are cut on business, and literally, the we couldn't make the line done. work. And it was just like, what are the odds? What are the oh, odds? Dear. No, but this is the thing. I think, a lot, I think a lot of this is a parenting issue, but there's a difference, certainly, with teenagers. Yeah. You know, your kid is out and about. If they're not on their phone, for a start, they don't get homework information from school. Um, they, they don't know when everyone else is meeting. They don't know that you don't get invites to things. Kids, I'm afraid, just like adults, could say, you know, they, don't, they have to be on, on their phones. Yep. The question is what they're doing on their phones and for how long. Well, well exactly. And, and we still you met up and knew what our timetables were and all the rest of it. We didn't have mobile phones. Yeah, but that's... Because we, we talked to each other and, and you, you had a paper diary where you had... I know, but we're not back in the dark ages. We're not back in the dark ages, but... Uh, Things I, have moved but, on. But again, I don't think... If, if phones are used for that and responsible parents will make sure that their children yeah. use those, the main... a large proportion of parents are not that responsible. No, and I think and that's... I think people... Are, they are using them as, as babysitters, yeah. whether it's the iPad or it's the phones, yeah. but they're also completely unaware of like what kids are doing, what yeah. they're seeing. The amount of parents... I know. They, they, they think, A, what they, they, their kid is watching is educational. It's not. No. Um, uh, they, they think that it's perfectly safe for them to be in the, you know, these sort of chats with these Instagram things. Like, no, I'm sorry. No. You wouldn't... Here, it's 7pm, right? The doorbell rings. There's a bloke you've never met before outside the door goes, I want to talk to your eight-year-old. Would you allow that adult in, to, that man in, to talk to you? No, you wouldn't. So why are you allowing them to do to that do on their online. phones? Yeah. I find it extraordinary and people and don't if, check if that stuff. bloke turned up in short, shorts, uh, dressed as a schoolboy and said, I want to talk to your age. Yeah, well, even more well, creepy. Even more creepy. But, but, and exactly, and that's the thing, kids just don't know. But also, the pornography they're seeing, yep. this is, especially with the smartphone thing, and they're it's sharing it at school, again, instant suspension, yeah. second time out. From, but the number of parents who are totally and utterly unaware that that's what and, they're And then, see. Then, you, then you get all these silly games. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, read a book. Yeah. Right, we're going to make one more attempt to speak to Miriam Cates. Miriam, are you there and can we hear you? Um, can you yes! hear me? Yay! Hey! Fantastic. <laughs> really good. We can hear you. <laughs> Miriam, the joys of technology. Let's get straight Absolutely. to it. Absolutely. I know. Should have used so, my mobile phone, perhaps. It's so <laughs> frustrating. The fact that everyone, everyone in the gallery is going, we can hear it. Well, that's great. I can't. Um, most, under, most parents of under 16 think they shouldn't have a smartphone. Do we, do we need to bring in a ban to make it easier for those parents who want to do the right thing? I do think we need to bring in a ban, yes. And I think there are several reasons for that. And let's talk about parenting in a minute. But firstly, I think all the evidence shows uh, that over the last 15 years, since smartphones became ubiquitous uh, for adults, of course, but, but children as well, Every potential measure you can think of to measure children's well-being and health has declined. Uh, you know, suicide has sadly gone up an awful lot for boys, but especially for girls. Self-harm, anxiety, addiction, uh, pornography viewing, all these very, very harmful things have exploded amongst children. It's not just in this country, it's across the Western world. Uh, you might have heard of a, an American psychologist, Jonathan Haidt, who's done a lot of research into this. He's just about to release a new book which um, collates all this evidence. 
evidence. So I think it's very clear that social media and smartphones are very, very harmful to children. And if you look at other things that have been introduced, uh, new technologies, uh, uh, new inventions uh, that harm children, we do eventually just ban them. So whether that's cigarettes, whether that's children going down mines, whether that's uh, introducing an age of consent, for example, there are some things that we just accept as a society are too harmful for children to handle. Uh, and we say, no, there has to be an age. And I think it is now becoming increasingly clear that this is the case uh, for smartphones and yeah. social media. So that's why I would support a ban yeah. uh, on that, as would the majority of parents. Now, of course, parenting is important. There are parents who take responsibility for this. There are parents who don't. And, you know, we can argue about um, how to improve people's sense of responsibility. But ultimately, I think the evidence shows that smartphones are so addictive uh, that even parents with the very, very best intentions can't actually look at everything their children is looking at. Not. They can't protect them from other children, what they're looking at. And so I do think there's a strong argument for, for a regulatory answer to this. Yeah. And again, if all the other kids in the class don't have this phone, then there's less pressure on you to have one. And that's a lot of parents go, well, I'm not really happy about it, but, you know, I'll, I'll give it to you. But then there are also the parents who go, oh, you too have my phone. I, I never, I always, I, was, I looked at the advice on that. I spoke to so many experts on my shows variously before I had my daughter. And I knew, I knew that that, that was something that was bad. But it, what's interesting also, all the big tech bosses in California who, who own, you know, the, the Facebooks and the Instagrams and make them, none of them let their kids anywhere near any of this stuff. Uh, they know it's addictive because they've designed it to be that Fine. way, to make money so they can afford to send their children to these wonderful exclusive schools where they don't use technology at all because they want their kids to grow up rather healthier and rather better educated as well. Exactly. The people in the know know that these things aren't safe for children. And you know, I don't think we should beat ourselves up too much as a society about this. This is such a new problem. This wasn't even a thing before 2010. But we also need to take full responsibility now that we can see yeah. the results uh, in the terrible effect it's having on children and take responsibility and deal with it. And I often use the analogy of, of road regulation. When the motor car first came in, everybody thought, what an amazing new technology, how much freedom it will give us. But then once enough people got motor cars, uh, lots of people started getting killed in road accidents and it became very clear that this wasn't acceptable. And so we started to introduce regulations, yeah. speed limits, which side of the road you should uh, drive on, penalties for people who don't drive safely. And I think it's very similar to that with mobile phones. Yes, they are a, an amazing invention that can bring an awful lot of good, but they're not safe for children. Uh, they do need to be regulated and we need to handle them in a way that doesn't bring harm to society. And I think we're at that point now. Yeah. But it's been really interesting over the last six weeks or so to see both here and in America, actually, a real movement building of parents who've just had enough, who just don't want this anymore, who see the damage it's do been doing to their kids, but know that they on their own can't affect can't a change. That. And that's, that's why crucial. we need government helping to be involved. Parents. Yeah, exactly, helping parents do the right thing. I've often thought with the mobile phone thing, or with games, you know, that especially boys, I think, particular playing those games. I've had a few parents over the years say to me, what can I do? You know, my son's on his Game Boy or whatever for 12 hours a day. I'm like... Sorry, I mean, does it, does it not have a plug on it? I mean, <laughs> pull it out, cut the plug off. Ta-da, problem solved. I mean, this is, this is Parenting 101, right? But the key thing is for me is it's not even what they're doing. I think there's a lot of what they're doing on their phones. A lot of what a lot of us do on our phones is, you know, I spend far too much time on Twitter. I don't play games on my phone, so that is one thing. Uh, but the, the, the pointless and utterly mindless, you know, the candy crushes, those sort of games and things like that, no good for anyone's brain and, of course, addictive. The porn, the horrible, the violence, all the stuff they're seeing, the, 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 the silly competitive stuff on Instagram and the, the weird sort of pictures that women do with those you know, the duck mouths. I mean, what else is going on there? But the other thing for me is, is what children are not doing when they're on their phones. Yeah, exactly. And I've seen groups of teenagers where they are literally all standing around looking at their phones. They're not talking to each other. So we, um, in years so by my daughter's so sleepovers, um, I've, I've literally, like, you know, I confiscate all the phones straight away because there's always a couple of girls who just want to do everything. On the no, phones, here we go. Phones are all over here. All sealed up. Thank you very much. Now have fun. But it's the fact that they're not playing sport. They're not talking to someone exactly. face to face. They're not. They're not dancing. They're not just having a laugh. They're you know playing pranks, whatever we used to do. 
it's a tragedy and, and I as a parent and I know you and many others look at our childhoods and compare it to oh, yeah. you know what our children are going through and feel a great sense of sadness for them and I think that's why we need societal level change because yes as an individual parent you can pull the plug you could deny your child access to this stuff but the truth is that they then don't have anybody to go to the park with to go and climb yes. a tree with because all the other children are on devices and so even you know well-meaning very um you know effective parents can't handle yeah. this alone and then, and and then you're the bad parent the and then, yeah thing. exactly now i've got to let you no, go no, but no, no. just fine i yeah, want to sorry. ask you about the conservative candidate for the uh nature manager mayoral election standing against andy burnham has today defected to reform uk this is dan barker which is a matter of weeks away from that may the second election um this is pretty damning for the Conservative Party. Uh, what do you make of this defection? Well, I've only just heard about it now, so I, I um, obviously can't comment in too much detail. But obviously, yeah, it's uh, it's it's shocking and sad from a Conservative point of view. I don't know, uh, you know, it's not my patch, so I don't know it, uh, in the characters involved. But clearly, it is going to be uh, tricky now to find a new candidate uh, and get enough nominations in time uh, for nominations closing. So, um, yes, I'm sure there'll be more to come on this story. But I suppose if I was going to make um, a neutral, a more neutral point, um, clearly. The Reform Party are doing increasingly well in the polls. And I think as, as mainstream parties, as Conservatives and Labour, or I, I should say the main parties, because I'm not trying to imply that Reform aren't mainstream at all, but the, the two major parties need to start asking questions about what's gone wrong with our electoral system when so few people, so many people are saying that they don't feel represented yeah. by uh, the major parties. Now, of course, Reform have every right to exist. Um, and, you know, Lee Anderson remains a, a good friend of mine. But I do think there's some real soul-searching to do uh, in the major parties uh, in terms of what's gone wrong. Are you considering defecting? I am absolutely not. Um, I am a conservative. I, but yeah, no, you're All entitled right. to ask. Miriam, I am absolutely conservative. We will leave it there. Miriam Case, really appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much indeed. Philip Ingram, just a, a quick thought on that. It's interesting. Just We talked earlier, obviously, about what the, the, the phones, but on the issue of the conservative candidate for the Greater Manchester mayoralty uh, defecting to reform, Mrs. Dan Barker. Um, she was talking about, and it's interesting to hear a Tory MP, because she's very much on sort of, I suppose, will be considered mm -hmm. the right wing of the Conservative Party, New Conservatives. Basically, you know, maybe we should ask ourselves why so many voters are looking at reform rather than us. I mean, it's nice to see an MP actually having a bit of introspection there. Yeah, and it's very refreshing to hear that. Um, and in the polls, we're not seeing Labour being affected yet, but reform are doing something right um, in the, their, their percentage of the poll increasing. And in, in, in terms of it going up and up, uh, very slowly, but nevertheless in one direction. Exactly. But thank you so much. Now, today we're going back to the question about the uh, government's flagship Rwanda bill. It suffered yet more defeats in the House of Lords last night. It's now being delayed until after Easter. Do you have any faith in the Rwanda de deportation policy? You can call 0344 You can text on 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Ray has done that and says, when will the unelected House of Lords get abolished? Tim says, we have no faith in the House of Lords. And Stephen says, it's an exchange scheme, so it will not reduce the numbers. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, again, fair, fair points. Uh, you guys know an awful lot more about this than most MPs, by the way. Uh, some of you have been getting in touch on the phones. Keep those calls coming in. Uh, let's go to Ray in Welling. Hello, Ray. Hello, Julia. How Hello. Are you? Very well indeed. What do you want to say? Yeah, it's this Rwanda bill. I mean... Anybody with an IQ over 30 knows that this is rubbish. You know, uh, basically, it's uh, never going to work. Um, but my, my idea would be, um, and I think you'd probably agree with this, is that these people on the boats want to get to Great Britain. Now, let them come to Great Britain um, and let them come to British soil, but the British soil will be in the Falklands. <laughs> so what we do... well, you I'm not sure the people in the Falklands will be that happy, but... Well, I know, but the thing is, is that there's very barren places on the Falklands, as we know, because, like, a lot of yeah. people spill blood out it's there. It's a harder life, yes. Yeah, and the thing is, is this, is we can put up Nightingale clinics in a matter of weeks. If Sunak came out tomorrow and said, I'm sending loads of builders out there with all the proper stuff, we're going to build some holding ports there. That's where, that's where you're going to be held. I mean, you probably wouldn't have to do that. I'm sure there are plenty un of uninhabited islands, uh, you know, around, dotted around the British Isles. So you're thinking if they never actually set foot on mainland British soil, they can't, they can't live like that, then that might be a deterrence, yeah? Well, I, th I think if you thought, actually, 
Sunak's doing something. He's actually sending the builders out there. He's actually sending all the material out there. And the thing is, is this, is that it's it's still British soil. So that you, all these... It, it, it was still, all the human rights lawyers wouldn't have an argument, would they? They can't say it's no, unsafe. No, I'm, quite, no. I'm quite enjoying that idea. Ray, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Coming up after the break, then we're going to talk about new rules requiring people to show photo ID at the polling station. We'll see up to 8 million at risk of losing their right to vote at the next general election. But will they? We'll discuss that. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We were supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Uh, welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you are with Talk TV. Now, a committee of MPs has claimed that new rules, which require people to show photo ID at the polling station, will see up to 8 million of us risk of losing our right to vote at the next general election. Joining me right now is former Labour advisor uh, Richard Power Said. Also, still with us is Philip Ingram in the studio. Um, Richard, um, thanks so much for joining us. Um, Look, you have to have voter ID. Sorry, voter, you have to have photo ID to do virtually anything. I remember having to show photo ID uh, when I got married. You have to have photo ID in a form of a passport uh, to uh, uh, to travel in or out of the country. Not everyone will have a passport. Most people will have a driving license um, to claim benefits. You surely have to identify yourself. Who is going to not be allowed to vote because they don't have photo ID? So there are literally two million people in this country who don't have the ID that they need uh, to vote. And that's very new, as in previously you didn't have to have that kind of identification, came in with the last election. How do they go about their normal daily lives it's without photo ID? It's a really good question. And what I would say is think about, you know, that neighbour who doesn't really go out very much, that 
elderly relative who would never buy anything online, and if they really needed yeah. to, they'd get a friend to. These people deserve to vote too. In fact, in fact, I would say, like, because a lot of them are quite socially disadvantaged in lots of mm. ways, those are the people who particularly we, we, we should encourage to vote. Yeah, it? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And it's going to be made so difficult for them. It has been made so difficult. Well, the, the, the thing is, it, the, the reality is that voting, um, no, having to show voter ID when you vote, is the norm in most European countries. Philip Ingram was talking on the show earlier from Northern Ireland. It's been the norm in Northern Ireland for, 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 quite, a, for quite a few for, elections. You know, for a very long time. We've done a trial in the United Kingdom of 1.36 million people. For years. Who, um, the same arguments came out before it came in saying, this is going to disenfranchise people from voting and everything else. It hasn't. Well, we all. know that it has already disenfranchised people in the UK because of the last uh, uh, local election. Yeah. So that's only a small that was the first the time it was used, wasn't yeah. it? And lots and of people turned up and didn't know they needed ID. 14,000 people. And at the local elections, we'll probably have lots of people again turning up and uh, not being able to vote. And the much bigger problem is all of those people who just don't bother even going to the polling station in the first place. Because they don't have it in the first place. Yeah, oh, but I here's the thing. The, the, one, of the, one of the things, like, the, I, we don't have ID cards in this country, so it's hmm. much easier. So European countries, you require ID. Well, it's fine, because everyone's required to have ID. In fact, I mean, when we're, if you're in Germany, you're a foreign citizen, you actually require required to carry your passport with you at all times. Yeah. I mean, people, you have to have photo ID. So it is different. I've always fought against us having ID in a sort Me of, too. you know, papers, please, uh, society. However, you know, again, I'm going back to you know, I'm the age where you, you, you got your blockbuster video rental card, you had to show photo ID. Uh, the thing is, when they announce this, then there are rules, there are some, here's some ID you can use. You, know, you can use your passport, your driving licence. An awful lot of the ID that is allowed to be used is ID for older people in terms of their, their, their pension entitlement, their travel cards and things like that, but not the same number of cards available for younger people. Surely we could just, you know, issue cards that people could voluntarily choose to have and they could be issued for... I know that you can get them for free. You can apply online and get them for free. That information is not widely out there and these are exactly the sort of people who wouldn't do that. And exactly. I do get that. Exactly. I do get that. But it, there must be a way of getting round this issue because it, I'm, my guess is there, that the vast majority of people who don't have photo ID don't engage in civil society at all. They don't vote. Well, let's think about um, the, the system that they have in Canada, which is uh, not perfect, but basically what you can do in Canada is it's election day, I've got ID, but, you know, maybe my elderly relative or my neighbour doesn't. We go together to the polling station. I sign an affidavit saying they are who they are. Yep. If I'm lying, I'm going to get in to lots fair, of trouble. To be fair, that's what you do when you apply for a passport for your right. kid. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, and we have a legal affidavit system in this country already, so it wouldn't be some incredible innovation. The fact that the Conservative Party has chosen not to go with that very sensible system that a similar country to us, Canada, has got, the fact that they are going with something which is different, disenfranchises 2, 2 million people, the fact that Jacob Rees-Mogg said, this is gerrymandering, he said, we are deliberately gerrymandering the system, okay. that says to me that you've got a desperate government that knows it's on the way out and they are trying to rig yeah, the system. And the idea is that the, pe the sort of people who have ID are more likely to be older people, more likely to vote Conservative, and, and that that's going to prevent people who are more likely to vote Labour from voting. And that is obviously a concern and should be dealt with absolutely 100%. Um, however, I found it extraordinary the number of things that you can't do um, if you don't have ID mm. of any kind, not even photo ID, but any ID, any proof of who you are at all. And yet someone can just rock up at a polling station without even their polling card and go, I'm, you know, I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and, and I would like that po I would like to, to, to have that polling card. And then I then rock up half an hour later and they say, well, you've already voted. And there's basically nothing I can do about it. And the amazing thing is that that system, the wonderful thing is that system has actually worked really well. We've had eight cases of proven oh, voter fraud. We don't, and, and, no, no we doubt, don't investigate them. No doubt there's way more. No doubt there's way more. But even if, you, indulge me on this, there's been eight proven cases over the last 10 years. Let's say that's, we'll be generous, we'll call it one a year. Now let's say that for each one of those, there was 10 it's still on a cases. tiny scale. It's Look, still tiny. I get that. I get that. However, we've also be seen some very big issues about like postal voting, and, and particularly in certain constituencies yeah. where we know, you know, the man is the is the master of the house, and he tells everyone how they vote. Mm. And we, we look, there are definitely some issues. There's I think a solution you, to that you can resolve separate, all of this stuff by everyone having to turn up, make pass their vote, and prove who they are. But, so there's a better solution to the postal vote um, one, which is that you just say there's a limit to the number of postal votes that you can do in one go. Yeah, okay, you, yeah, well, again, if, if 
if, if there are 10 people living in the house and each person posts theirs individually, though that's a different thing. I um, just want to ask you also, just very briefly, before we finish, um, just had this announcement that the Conservative candidate for the Greater Manchester uh, mayoralty vote, that votes uh, on May the 2nd, um, is Dan Barker. He has defected to Reform UK. Tories are going to be searching for a new candidate. Of course, we know Andy Burnham, the Labour uh, MP, um, Manchester mayor in situ. Um, what do you make of that news? I think that the Conservative Party is in this, you know, really unenviable situation where if they shift to the centre, they'll lose one chunk of votes. If they shift to the right, they'll lose another. The only way you win an election is by having a big coalition. Very broad coalition. Very broad With coalition. With lunatics like, like, like Jeremy Corbyn. Of course, I mean, of course, bearing in mind, of course, Reform UK going up in the polls appears to hit Labour votes as well. We know that. Um, I'm going to say a big thank you, to, very big thank you to Richard Palisade for joining us, a former Labour advisor. Big thank you also to Philip Ingram for joining us all today. Thank you so much indeed. Uh, sadly, we have come to the end of the show. Don't shout at me. Yes, I am popping off on holiday uh, next week. Meet Carwell is going to be in you, for you Monday to Wednesday. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Up next, it's Kevin and Alex. Have a great afternoon. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth plinth. Mr.